Okay. Um, hello, everyone, again. Uh, welcome back for those of you who are joining us for part two, having watched part one. Um, we are joined today uh, by, uh, well, obviously, I've introduced my my friend and colleague, Eva Masieska, uh, but we're delighted to be joined today uh, also by a gentleman called Tim Staffel. Uh, unfortunately, we we this is live, um, very much live at the moment, though you may be watching it on replay. Uh, and as with live, we're always at the mercy of technology, uh, though I can't imagine uh, if we went to a Queen show, uh, we would see um, technological problems of the like that we've had today. Um, but uh, so we, we can hear Tim, uh, but we won't be able to see him, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, we're delighted to be joined by Tim. And um, for those of you who uh, are unfamiliar, uh, Tim was um, in a band with uh, Brian May and Roger Taylor, um, which, uh, you know, I think could be described as, um, uh, you know, a, I suppose something that Queen grew out of. Um, so, you know, we're very interested uh, to hear from Tim about his story, um, but also, you know, particularly keen to hear about insights, uh, you know, from those early days, um, though clearly much time has, uh, has passed um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're looking into uh, the, the, you know, the distant past, really, 50 plus years ago. Um, but we're delighted anyway, Tim. Um, Tim, so, you know, I, I think if you can cast your mind back, um, one of the things uh, that happened, uh, you know, output, musical output uh, from yourself and uh, Brian and Roger um, you, you actually recorded a smile. Uh, you gigged a smile. Um, could you tell us a little bit about those uh, those early days and um, uh, you know what it was like? Uh, well, uh, you've got to. I think you have to take it back a, a couple of years in, into um, early early school uh, environment um, where. I guess kids of 13 or 14 faced with the prospect of making a living, um, uh, uh, graduating, moving into adulthood, uh, um, were bombarded with the, uh, with the 60s re revolution as it was happening, uh, which were, became, a, became a, a pretty good option for what you wanted to decide to do with your future. Uh, and I do think that for most of us who ended up uh, attempting to navigate through a musical career, uh, it, it was actually, it was the, the fact that it was a glamorous option um, initially. And, uh, and of those of us who were, who were going through puberty, it was a, um, it was a good, a good, um, a, a good shop window, if you like, for negotiating one's uh, dealings with one's uh, gender preference, um, and uh, uh, and so really it was a it was a kind of um, the thing that gave rise to smile. The thing that gave rise to 1984 was a was was a was a very simple social equation, which basically um, uh, basically made us want to be. Um, it, it, important, um, significant, uh, creatively, artistically significant. Uh, and, and 1984 was the kind of the workshop for Smile in the same way that Smile was the workshop for Queen. Um, uh, each incarnation developed a more professional um, uh, approach to, uh, to the uh, to the, the process of becoming a, a, a working musician, a, an earning, working and earning musician. Um, sm smile, I, I, I mean, I guess if, I guess Smile could probably have evolved into a, um, into a, uh, a working band with the, with the economics uh, work, working properly, with the economics um, yielding 
uh, yielding enough income to for for it to self sustain. Yeah. Uh, uh, but of course, you know, the three individuals, four individuals, five individuals in any band, you're going to have um, you're going to have the, indi- the the problem of the individuals m- maintaining co- a cohesion with the rest of the and and of course my, my cohesion failed after about eighteen months to two years of of working in something that we had initially uh, predicated uh, and succeeded in in meeting what we'd predicated in terms of a, a heavy rock trio um, with with vocals and a degree of it that, that we thought we thought of as intelligence. Um, uh, uh, but uh, it, but uh, eventually for myself, at least, I, I became um, I became convinced that uh, that my direction lay elsewhere, and so I, 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 I moved on. I moved away, moved into onto a different track. Yeah, to, I suppose you know that's the idea of um, you know pursuing the artistry. Uh, you know your artistic sensibilities uh, taking you in a different direction, um, basically. I, I think, to a certain extent, one of the um, one of the um, the USPs of Smile, as as it was with with a lot of rock groups, was um, was the the more histrionic, the theatrical and histrionic nature of the uh, of the um, of the presentation of the performing of the performing principles. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, at, at one point, I I think I'd got personally, I'd got. I'd got. I'd begun to be, personally. I'd begun to be seduced by jazz and by um, and by so, and certainly by um, the poetry of Dylan and mm-hmm. and the poetry of other songwriters, which is kind of in a different. It's a different realm. It's in a different realm, and and that's the one I. That's the one I fell into. Um, um, it did. It did sound. Um... I mean, I think a lot of people who will be watching this um, will probably be aware of Smile, um, and uh, but not all. Um, so, I mean, Smile did uh, at the time produce a single, uh, didn't you? We did. Um, um, uh, I'm not entirely sure whether it was only released in America. It was a, a, one of my compositions, my first effective composition. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why it was chosen um although of course the flip side was the was the first the first co-written song that brian and i wrote which was step on me Mm -hmm. um maybe it was a maybe it was a double a side because i would have said that step on me was a better song um uh, but earth earth for some reason seemed to be carrying the flag so uh but I think it was only released in the States as a seven inch single. Uh, clearly the problem with one of the problems with Smile was that the marketing wasn't, um, wasn't up to scratch. Uh, uh, Cause I think if it, if it had been, and with a song as strong as Step On Me and I, and actually Earth was okay. Let me, I, I won't shoot myself down in flames over that one. Um, I think that could have marketed. I think that could have instigated a, a, um, uh, a, a possibly successful second, uh, um, second sort of uh, tranche of of record company money. I mean, that's the whole uh, the whole mm-hmm. key to it is that is that you know once the economics doesn't work from the point of view of the a and r men and the record companies then it no longer is a proposition and and it's a uh, it it it's self-fulfilling or self-unfulfilling if you like mm-hmm. the less money you get put in the less likely you are to be successful and uh, that's really what happened with with smile it went up like a very small rocket and came down very quickly uh, and and trickled out and I think, I mean, that's possibly also one of the other reasons why I went was because I could see that it was on a downward glide economically anyway. And, uh, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to be part and parcel of that. 
who the, inspired sorry can if i can ask a question who inspi inspired you at the time um do you mean musically or socially you, yeah musically socially um, you, you mentioned a bit like the yeah. uh musically um well it, initially i think what what inspired me in terms of musically was um was the was the the rock principle the the kind of histrionic rock principle wanting the the rock attitude um uh, as as evidenced by people like the stones and 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 really um really demonstrative performers i think that was the, that's what initially inspired me uh, and that and the music was kind of almost secondary but was was there a, perhaps a culture tim you know the this idea of uh uh, you know, youth being suppressed and wanting to express itself was that is that part of what you're saying? Well, I think it, that was that's probably true mm. in the UK, less mm. true in the States. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as my experience in the early seventies uh, showed me, um, yeah. uh, but the, but what was inspiring me musically at that time was the was my peer group, the rock peer group in London at, at the time. Um, the Who, Jimi Hendrix, Cream, uh, people who are who were playing the kind of music that, that we that we would have been categorised as as part of. Uh, it was a, I mean, actually, you um, and one and one gains strength from one's peer group, and and one also probably, in fact, initially wants peer group acceptance. Beyond anything else, um, uh, or at least in parallel with uh, monetary success, um, what was uh, was the were, were the other members of the band? You know, were you sort of unified in in that um, uh, you know attitude? Um, initially, yes, uh, but we drifted apart. I think because of that, uh, and and I, I and clearly I was I I took the wrong well I took a, a a path which, which wasn't predicated on, on, on enormous success because I, well, I factored out of it. I factored out of my involvement in it, the need to be a, a, a performer. I, I, I was, in fact, I, but then you see, I was never really much of a performer, uh, not like Freddie was. I mean, um, uh, uh, I, I mean, and, and in a way, maybe smile. The three of us were not, were not overly, we were not overly attractive as performers. So I don't mean that. I mean that as, as a as a musical phenomenon rather than uh, attractive as people. Mm. I mean, I, I, we were probably attractive as people, but as a band, I don't think we were quite so physically attractive as, as what happened to Queen when Freddie actually got to create the persona of the band that, that came afterwards we did we were we were we, we were just we were just we were we were a bit gray in compared to the compared to the the rainbow color of queen as it as it um as it was to evolve tim do you remember um how the name queen was received um because you know i mean i it's about well well, I, I I don't remember. I wasn't around. I'm clearly much too young. But um... well, I I know I know the the funny thing was I, I I've had this conversation, or not this conversation, but I've had a conversation about about the the character of homophobia in in the late sixties, um, and uh, and I, and I can't quite get my head round. I know that it. We. I. I'm not sure that we ever bothered whether whether we knew or whether we thought that Freddie was gay initially. I. I don't even know that we ever even mentioned it. I. I don't recall us ever even touching on the subject. But then, on the other hand, I don't. I don't recall in in my college days any anxiety or or. Or tension about 
about the, the, the schism between hetero and homosexuality. Um, but certainly there were, there were gigglings when the, the name Queen was, was, um, was first predicated by Freddie, as far as I remember, from some people I knew. Some people chortled as if as if the as if the the, the fact that queen was was a, a a word that was synonymous with the gay community uh, was was somehow derogatory to what they were trying to what they were trying to do in other words be serious and 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 produce serious musical content uh, yeah that was so it certainly was it certainly was in some uh, quarters um regarded as um slightly amusing i mean i i you know for me you know nothing really registered apart from it was distinctive you know as a young yeah, yeah. person sort of coming to the name and one of the things that you know we, we're very interested in, in in understanding a lot of about is uh you know brand dna um you know and yeah, yeah, yeah. within music yeah. Uh, and you know, of course, later you know, or well, it didn't take long before um, the word was, you know, you know, a very clear trademark, and was being yeah. presented in certain ways that well, were very distinctive, know. and lent themselves to merchandising, and you know, they were, it, it just was very distinctive, really. I think. I, I guess so. I misunderstood the question. Then I mean. No, I think I, I think you gave a brilliant answer, Tim. To be honest. Um, I mean, it, was, it definitely was a thing at that time. The the um, the 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 the, uh, the 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 gay connection. It was definitely a thing at the time, um, but it didn't. It certainly wasn't negative. Mm. Um, and as for brand recognition, well, the 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 thing that defined it of course was the fact that you could employ royal royalistic mm. uh, iconography yes to um as as your graphic language which mm. freddie did which clearly freddie did and actually that was that was quite uh majestic innovative, really wasn't yeah. it it, it yeah. was innovative um, yeah uh, it, it was i don't think it, it was kind of not it was it was almost more formal than the 60s had become it was almost like uh it was almost like retro retrograde if you think of of the the kind of looseness of the of the creative and graphic arts in the 60s i'm thinking i'm thinking of um uh uh people like i mean like warhol for instance um Warhol using prints of Marilyn Monroe and just colouring them as a silk screen, and the kind of the kind of deliberate looseness of those of, the, of those uh, 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 that that kind of work, uh, pop art, uh, and uh, then 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 the Queen thing was a kind of almost like a a return to some kind of formal um, formal iconography. Mm. Uh, it had, I mean, it had great grandiose connotations, didn't it? And uh, you know, British, you, you know, um, something synonymous with yeah, it not did. just Britain, but but and it was, was British. And there was definitely a there was definitely this element of pomp rock about mm. quite a lot of bands, I think, in those days as well. Uh, um, uh, with the kind of triumphalism. Um, but the presence of art, there was a presence of art within it all as well, wasn't the Tim? I, you know, I know, um, you know, um, in Smile, for example, you know, you'd produced sort of logos or, uh, you know, sort of imagery that went along with, you know, with that. Where did the name Smile come from, actually? Do you remember? Oh, uh, uh, I think it was. Was there a rationale? Um, only, the... only that it was. Uh, it was a way of it was a, a way of defining good nature. Mm, that's really good. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, getting a sense of building blocks here, 
you know, you mentioned 1984 as well, which was a band you were in with Brian mm -hmm. before Smile mm -hmm. and the sort of progressive, uh, you know, the evolution really, um, yes. you know, and the developing professionalism and skills and art for, you know, the sort of research and development process that uh, um, was going on really at that time. And it was all, a, a, you know, I get the sense that it was all a, um, informed by the political, economic, cultural, you know, and cultural landscapes at the time, the it, there were responses. I, you know, I these... think that was an accelerating process which mm. paralleled our our sort of development as in, individuals because 1984 in 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 this, in school days, well you can't get away from the fact that we were adolescents and mm. you know our our intellects were unsophisticated i mean they were developing um then when smile existed we had been through freddie and i went through uh, art college at ealing and we were we had had a decent grounding in graphic design and and visual pr so the the smile logo was kind of um, the result of that, um, uh, and available uh, on face masks now, uh, I believe, Tim. Yes, it is. Yes, I've got one here. Oh, you can't see. We can't see, unfortunately, oh, but so we'll take your word for it. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, which um, which are produced by by the Queen um, uh, by the Queen uh, machine, as it mm. were. Uh, I mean, you know, interestingly, you've you've maintained a really, uh, you know, good, you know, connections with um, with Queen, and you know, that's a, it's kind of another reason. But uh, you found yourself involved with the biopic as well, didn't you? Um, yes, I did. Uh, uh, can you tell I... us about about that and the process. What happened with? Uh, I mean, you you know, there's this bit in the film where um, uh, you know Brian's saying something like. Um, Humpy Bong Tim, you know, which yeah, is the yeah. band you, yeah. you know, you moved on to. Um, yeah, and there's a really nice sort of uh, depiction. I know it was, you know, wasn't quite how it manifested. No, no. Of you know, Freddie, just the sense of them coming together, uh, you know, as a maybe a consequence of. That I, I, have, I had no problem with the shorthand that they employed to um, to depict that that changeover. Um, well, the film was a monstrous success, wasn't it? You know, to, certainly the audiences uh, yeah. uh, voted with their feet, didn't they? And, yeah, and... no, no, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, every single, um, uh, uh, well, most, shall we say, most uh, bio biographical pictures, I think, um, tend to take liberties with the timeline, certainly, um, if not with the characters. Um, uh, I'm thinking, I mean, the story of Chess Records, for instance, Cadillac Records, the movie Cadillac Records, um, is, is far worse in its deviation from reality than, than Bohemian Rhapsody. I mean, Bohemian Rhapsody, I thought, was a, a really respectful um, pricey of the story uh, of, of, of the evolution of the band. I... I, I uh, uh, I thought it was really great. I, I know I've had I've heard people, I've heard people say, "Oh, but hang on," uh, but now nah, you know I, it was it was um, it was a good movie, and and I, I was I was proud to be involved with it. I, I it's always a, I've always looked rather bemusedly at the at the at the fact that I've I've managed to maintain some kind of profile through the years and I often think to myself well hang on every major band has got the bloke who left before they became famous how, how is it I've how is it they've always given me a name check how is it they've always been so nice about it to me and I mean but they have and anyway we've always uh, we've always maintained a, a thoroughly healthy um genial relationship so uh uh, I, I'm not. I'm not looking a gift horse in the mouth by any stretch of the imagination. But I, I do wonder whether I really deserve it. I, I, I know what you, people say very kindly that the roots of Queen existed in Smile, and perhaps they did. But um, if that's a, 
<laughs> if that qualifies me for a ticket to uh, stardom, <laughs> then fair enough. <laughs> well, I, I think whilst um, clearly, you know, things, you know, things never stand still, do they? And, you know, you, you know, you always sort of grow and develop, uh, but, uh, you know, from my observations, I mean, you know, one thing I should say within this conference, uh, you know, there, you know, we can't really ask certain things, and there are some things we will never know, and a lot of them, a lot of things that you know we'll be talking about will be subjective and opinion based. Sure. Um, but uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, aware of Smile, um, and as an entity in its own, you know, it was something that. I enjoyed immensely. Um, but, I, you know, I noticed also that the Smile catalogue, whilst it was, uh, it f found its way onto vinyl uh, in the early 80s in an album, a Japanese import called yeah. Getting Smile, and subsequently it found its way onto CD. I note it doesn't appear on the major streaming sites. That's right. Um, it's not, people have, you know, YouTube is user uploaded yeah. uh, content. So, and actually, interestingly, we, you know, I found, I suppose someone had uploaded Get In Smile, but also put a load of either Smile or 1984 live performances yep. of, I think, Brian playing, you know, doing a Hendrix thing and stuff yep. like that, yep. you know. Um, uh, you know, there was quite a bluesy flavour to all of that. So yep. it's there, it's there and it's digital, but um, who, who owns the copyright? What, are we... I suppose the Queen Queen management do. I I, uh, I mean, I, I don't. Yes, I don't know why it doesn't exist uh, mm. unless there is unless there is a plan for it. Uh, I, and the only plan I can possibly think of is that it it could be remastered. It could be it could be remastered and cleaned up, and then put onto a streaming site. But I've heard nothing from Queen Management, so. Uh, Give them a nudge, Tim. You know, we'd, <laughs> it would be great to uh, well, see this this material, you know, the, the stuff that, you know, everyone would be happy with. But because there was an album with six tracks on, and I know we spoke about this previously, and you, can't, you kind of revisited it, and revisiting it thought, actually, that was better than I remembered it. Kind yes, of that's thing. true. That's true. Uh, it, it, yeah, the, the CD itself, which which I was involved with the production of it. Um, uh, Ghost of a Smile was Ghost it. Ghost of a Smile. Did it have Eddie Howell on as well? The yes, it uh, did. The, I, I I wasn't too keen on that, but uh, but then since I didn't have any, I, I didn't have any of the. Uh, um, I did, I wasn't um, making any decisions about the, the. I just happened to be involved with the graphic design and the and the sleeve notes and and just generally um but it was yes it did sound better than i remembered and i actually i don't know if that was a partially remastered or not but certainly more could be done now it could be it could be i don't think the the original tapes still exist but it could be um it could be re remastered now and improved and then uploaded i think to um to spotify or apple music or whatever uh, as Smile, you know, a sort of precursor to Queen, um, yes, you yeah, know. But, yeah. but I mean, you know, I can tell you now that, you know, it, it, the Japanese vinyl, I, 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 you know, there are people that argue Japanese vinyl is, um, you know, uh, uh, sounds better than uh, other vinyls. Um, but it did sound mighty fine back in the day. Um, and yeah. I, it was very expensive, though, Tim. I have to say, uh, the import uh, I bought it in HMV in London, um, and uh, it was something like eleven quid. You know, which was yeah. a huge. Yeah. I, I had to check with the Queen fan club that it was actually, you know, such a large sum of money to spend back then. Yeah, and I didn't want to not it not to be what no, I sure. wanted it to be. Sure. But but then you know when I you know it 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 had. It was its own thing. Um, but I think there's, I mean, we're running out of time, unfortunately, Tim. And I, I, I'm going to try and have a quick, I'm going to see if Eva has a question for you to answer. And I'm going to have a quick glance at the comments that I see have been coming through. Okay. Uh, and, and see if, you know, if there's anything. But, um, uh, yeah, it'd be great to see uh, 
that material um, available. Um, and I think, and also that, you know, there's that other idea that, you know, formats used to be an obstacle to accessing music. Mm. Uh, you know, we music was very expensive to buy and you'd have to think, you know, yeah. um, carefully what you bought. You didn't want to buy anything you weren't going to like. I've kind of sure. hit that point. Now, uh, you know, Queen's catalogue, for example, as it's available digitally on, you know, all of the platforms, yeah. Yeah. there's no barrier. And, and, and that do you think that might be in some way why people are finding you know, why the popularity is just exploding again, you know, that there, there's no obstacle and everyone can enjoy it. Uh, I, well, I, I guess, I, I mean, I always think that the, really think that the popularity of Queen is that, it is, is the fact that they are one of, if not the only band that managed to successfully combine um, uh, super presentation with high intellect rock and roll. Are there, there's not many, I, the only people I can think of that come anywhere close to, to, to achieving that, uh, I suppose would be maybe, but, but nothing like as strongly would be like the Beach Boys perhaps back in the day, um, uh, maybe Steely Dan. Um, uh, and that's about it. Um, uh, and, and I swear, I think their longevity owes its um, owes its uh, owes its um, existence to is the fact that it's 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 a it's it's a holistic it's holistic rock and roll. It has everything. It has it has pizzazz. It has intellect and, well, what can you say? I think you said it, you know, yeah, you said yeah. it. Yeah. I, I noticed on, on the, there's a question, there's a, just one question, and it's one that I actually all, all slightly asked. And there's loads of questions and loads of comments uh, yeah. from people watching. Uh, one of them is who wrote April Lady and who wrote Blag? But I asked you who wrote Polar Bear because it actually says on the album Unknown. Yeah, um, well, we know that's Brian's song. Yeah. And um, and uh, now I, I was, my memory is useless, but um, uh, um, April Lady was written by a, an English, I think an Eng, another English musician in a, in a, I think from the band Matthew Southern Comfort. Um, uh, because Matthew Southern Comfort did a version of it. Um, uh, and Black S. Lucas, S. Lucas, I'm just yeah, Steve remember. Lucas, that's right. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 now he, as far as I recall, he was a member of Matthew Southern Comfort. Okay. Um, uh, who you who you may or may not be familiar of as a as a contemporary band of the time, because yeah. they did a version of it. Uh, did you have a connection with them? None at all. Oh, okay. None at all. Nice um, song, though. Nice song, beautifully performed. I have to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting song. Um, what were you looking? I mean, was you know? Did you need more material? You know, was there a reason for a cover? Or I think Fritz Fryer just said, "Look, I've got this great song. Want you to do it?" And we said, "Oh, okay then." Um, it's true that we didn't really have enough material for an album. Well, in actual fact, it was never intended to be. A coherent body of work. It was just tracks we put down. It was only co uh, um, collected together in retrospect and turned into a single album. Um, Blag was was a. We I think we felt that a lot of the material that was on there was quite quiet and gentle. There was nothing visceral, hmm. and that's why we we between us wrote Blag. It was based on a a riff by Roger. Uh, and and it it came together, it came together in the studio, and it was a it was a I think a joint composition. But it, but if I had to say who deserves sixty percent of the royalty and who deserves forty percent, I'd say Roger deserves sixty percent, and Brian and I would have deserved forty percent. But you know, so, I mean that's interesting. You you're describing a collaborative oh, approach yeah. to songwriting, and Queen 
was slightly different, wasn't it? There was, somebody would give birth to a song or conceive a song. Yeah, but I think the I think that what was collaborative was the arra- was the arranging. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, but also, can, can, the, there was there's it's quite it's a very good early indicator of the sort of Brighton rock uh, thing that song. You know, Brian's start yes, really it is yeah um, um, exploring you know dimensions of the guitar that yeah. are very characteristic of his playing yeah, style. See, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, I, I mean, the thing about Queen is. Uh, and the other thing, just to refer back to the fact that they're in, in, intellectually interesting, is mm. that what's great about Queen is that they are they're great one for structure, mm. song structure. Now it, it's it's you can see it elsewhere. It's pretty easy to write a song with two chords, a middle eight, and a chorus. And and I'd say ninety percent of most pop music is done that way. It's mm. it's a lot of it is quite uninspiring even though even stuff that's 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 way up there in, and and has been successful but queen never lost sight of the fact that what makes a song interesting is is an interesting structure uh and my goodness i i hope i've done the same um but to me that's everything in a song is structure uh, and um and queen queen have got it in spades Tim, we, do you know we've run out of time? Uh, I, but you've actually—I was going to actually ask you, you know, this this thing you know, about the notion that sets Queen apart, uh, you know, um, and may have contributed to their remarkable success. And I think you've an, you've kind of given us a brilliant answer to that question. We've run out of time. Okay, I'm going to try and talk you into uh, in the future into um, maybe we can do some sort of. Uh, write a paper about you uh because i just feel we've we've you know how we've barely scratched the surface yes, and there's, there's so so much else to talk about the know, like the early dynamic in the band and how it developed and um oh. also the issue about lack of marketing i found very interesting you know how yeah, it happens yeah. that one band has practically no marketing and the next one achieve so much probably largely because of of good marketing well the it, the importance of that in the, in the band's success i mean i have got that oh, there's a lot i can say generally generically about about my relationship with the music business and my my history with the music business in a situation where i might not be able to remember specific instances mm-hmm. but i could i can but i do spec i spe- I'm the kind of person who just speculates anyway. I, I, I walk through the day and I speculate on everything. I mean, and I'm sure you are too. And I'm sure Tony is as well, because we're that kind of people. Um, uh, everything is something to be digested and to be comprehended. And, uh, and I would, yeah, I'd, I'd, dearly like to, I'd dearly like to investigate this further because one thing we haven't talked about is this, is the fact that, is the the, un, the the fundamental social phenomena that gives rise to um, mm-hmm. to these kinds of mass movements, mm-hmm. um, uh, and I the, I find that immensely interesting, personally. Yeah, Tim, thank you so much. I can't we, we can't thank you enough. Uh, you know, one of the actual it was a comment on uh, from one of the people watching. Uh, that they'd like to see a paper or something, you know, about this. So I'm yeah. grabbing hold of that, and we'll pick up this conversation on the other side of this. Um, uh, I'd love to think we could do more. Uh, you know, it's it's been an, an, an honour and a privilege, Tim. To uh, oh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I'm devastated that my camera is playing up. Uh, I have no idea, as I say, what has happened here. Um, um, but maybe next time we can. We, if we think about doing it again, I maybe you know I can get the camera to work. Yeah, I, I mean we we gave it a good go today. There, there was yeah. just some yeah. gremlin, uh, and you know it's live uh, at the end of the day, and you know we are um, dependent on technology. Uh, mm-hmm. And if we didn't try these things, it would be a great shame, wouldn't it? And oh but it's no, been, absolutely been brilliant! It's been brilliant. Thank you, hopefully, Tim. Hopefully, we can do it again. Yes, definitely. I'd, I'd love that. Thank right. you so much. Okay, Tim. So if you, you you're you. welcome to stay with us um, or watch it on YouTube, but when we're waiting in the wings, I'm sorry, Phil. Um, 
we we would just, we've just been running late today. Uh, we've got Phil, the amazing Phil Hillborn, who's oh. the, a guitarist extraordinaire. Um, so hopefully everyone can. I can see you now, Phil. I'm there. Um, I should be. Can you hear me? I can't. We can hear loud and clear. Good. And we can see the guitar, which is uh, always very exciting as well. Does it work? <laughs> Can you hear that? All right. Uh, we can hear it. We can hear Good. it. Good. It's not all yes. horrible. Okay. It's not. It's a. It's not that loud in here, but it's. Uh, it will give you an approximation. But Brian is very loud when he plays, so I can only give a, a rough kind of, yeah, you know, ism on him. You know. Good. Well, we we, we want. Uh, you know, we we don't want to blow your head off there. Uh, <laughs> volume. I had enough of that in my time. Don't worry about that. So. Um, yeah, so I think it would be great if we could start off uh, talking a little bit about your relationship with Queen and some of the projects that you've worked on. Um, where to start? There was "We Will Rock You." You're one of the guitarists in "We Will Rock You." Uh, yeah, which... one of the one of the many actually. Can I, can I start with that because it's yeah, um, sure. It was a very interesting thing. I mean, for me, it was nearly random. I mean, my I, actually, can I go back even further than that? I mean, I I, I obviously play guitar all my life and I've been doing it for a long time. And I think I heard Bowie Rhapsody. It's one of it's one of those songs that you always remember where you were when you heard, first heard it. And uh, I was, I think, 14, 15 in the bath and it came in the radio. It was like, oh my God, what is this? And I couldn't move and sat there in cold water by the time I finished. Um, <laughs> and- It's quite a long song, isn't it? it, it yeah. It and, would go cold. <laughs> yeah. And then um, I remember that, I think it was in the winter, I mean, in black and white, there was a concert on BBC where they were playing Liar and Ogre Battle, and I'd never seen anything like it in my life. And so that, from that point onwards, I was aware of who, who they were and what they were doing and everything else. I think I was probably about 15 at the time. Anyway, cut forward to 2002. Um, we Will Rock You had, had basically just opened, and the two guitarists who were on it were Laurie Weisfield, um, from Wishbone Ash and Alan Darby, who Alan Darby had done loads of stuff, Eric Clapson and, and whatever. And I went to a benefit in London with a friend of mine, Jeff Whitehall, and we bumped into Laurie and Alan. And uh, the conversation was, oh, I've just started doing this show called We All Rock You. I said, oh, well, I heard about that, but I didn't, you know, go for it. I actually knew that a lot of guitar players had gone for it. And it was very competitive because it was the dream thing for everyone to do. Um, and he said, just said to me, oh, Phil, are you, are you around at the moment? And as it happens, I, I just finished a, a lot of work. The, the way um, I work for guitarists and guitar technique, techniques magazines and uh, the way they work, it, it just changed for me. So I was doing less studio work. So I had the time to do it. And um, Laurie said, well, do you want to come in and have, have a look? And then you can you can do it because I'm off with Tina Turner on tour. So um, and then Alan's going to be going away soon. So we need to leave it with people that we can trust who can do it. So. I've gone in to have a look at it, and I knew nothing about theatre because I was come from a rock and roll background. I'd been playing with Nick Hammer Brain from Iron Maiden, and, and you know, doing lots of other sessions and stuff like that, and, and not theatre, which was completely different because you're dealing with conductors and you're dealing with a whole, whole different kettle of fish. And um, I've gone in there, and the band I knew Neil Murray because I'd played with him in the past, um, and so Laurie I, I obviously knew, and. Alan and I, I met, and Tony Bork was on drums, and he was lovely. And the band were fantastic. I, I remember I sat in and watched the first night. The way it worked is you go in and you watch, and then you basically have someone turn around and go, well, do you think you can do it then? And you go, yeah, okay. And then you go away and you learn all the material. Um, and then you phone up and you go, I'm ready. And then they'll get you in. And then when they get you in, they they, they have to sit behind you. And if you're not good enough, um, they – you, they give you the shepherd's crook, they pull you off and, and you'll never ever return. And it was honestly the most stressful, like three hours of my life. It was, it was terrible. And I won't say for a minute it was perfect because it wasn't. I mean, I came from rock background and, and looking back on it, it was probably, I couldn't control the guitar pro properly as well as, you know, you learn to. Um, but Mike Dixon was the MD and he was so helpful in kind of, it was one of those people, musical directors, I'd never worked with them before, but I realised with him that he would do the, the thing where where he would say, I really love what you're doing and it's amazing, you're a great player, but, and he would tell you a specific thing that you need to change. And then the next week it'd be something else. And then over time you could see that you're actually being moulded into, you know, what he would want. And Brian was in a lot, you know, pretty much all the way through the first couple of years, or longer than that, of Rock You. And... Um, you knew you'd done well. This is, I think, um, an anecdote I've used quite a few times. He used to sit, we were up on the gantry playing, and then one of the guitarists would go down and do Bowie and Rhapsody and the big thing at the end. Um, and um, Brian would 
come along and, and watch and he'd be in the box opposite us and he'd have his laptop and if he was watching the show his face would be lit up by the laptop but if he, if if there was something he didn't like his face would be glowing from the light of his laptop where he was making notes to give to you for later on and i can remember sitting there and going look his face is glowing Jack, and he's making notes about us yeah. <laughs> that he, happened a few times but, uh, but he was lovely feedback. Must, must, must do better the feedback yeah yeah i mean the, the first show i did the very first one i did he was there i walked in and he was he was standing there i got introduced and you know hello and he said he turned around and he said and i thought oh my god i've got to do it with him watching you know not the first one and um he said oh I, i'd love to um, stay and watch you play but we're going off to theater to the theater and it was like whoo thank goodness for that and a couple of weeks later um I've done the matinee on a Saturday and I've gone up to the band platform more relaxed and he Brian's up there. Can I, do you mind if I watch, if I watch the show tonight and I plug into your mixing desk? So basically he's hearing, he's hearing me louder than anyone else for three hours. And he, so he plugged in and he's listening to it, but he was lovely. I mean, it's so encouraging and so like giving about everything to do with it. There wasn't a question you, you, you couldn't ask that he wouldn't answer you, answer, you know, answer you um, clearly and, about and give you the information about it you know what pick up did you use for this and, and so on how did you play that and it show you or, or whatever it was um so he, he just wanted it to be perfect by the sound oh there, I mean, there, you know, yeah uh, forgive me because you know yeah, i wasn't yeah. there and you were and it, it's yeah. all you know i have to say it's a it's a matter of, a, of opinion or you know but there's a there's a definite sense of you know a, a real level of attention to detail a, uh, you know, aspiring for things to be perfect, and uh, you know that things like that are very evident in in things. You know, in Brian's. So, if you look at, for example, Good Company as an example of something, yeah. uh, you know that you know looking back at the technology they had was truly remarkable. Oh yeah, astonishing. And must have taken. I don't know how long it, it, it took, but uh, you know, a ridiculous amount of time. But the, the, is that something you know? We were lucky was there was their baby and, and Roger was in quite a lot as well, but Brian definitely more, but it, it was attention to everything, the script. Um, ben Elton was in a lot as well because he obviously, you know, did the story and everything. And, and in the first uh, the first couple of years, there was there, all the time, you know, and even when it went to a new place, Brian would be over there on the opening night, he'd be there and he'd get up and play and and um, you just got used to seeing him around, you know, and then I got I did some work for him. Um, outside of that, doing uh, checking music books and so forth and so on for his um, his company, and um, it's just been a long relationship. When I look back at it, that was two thousand and two. I mean, it's like a long time ago now. But um, anyway, I did that from two thousand and two. I've actually written the dates down because I'll forget otherwise. I did it from two thousand and two to two thousand and fourteen, which is twelve years. And I didn't do it all the time. There's, I'd like to mention there's a whole load of guitar players went through. We were Rock you. And apart from Laurie and Alan, who kicked it off, and say Neil Murray on bass, and the keyboard players, Neil Drinkwater, and a lot of the MDs, um, there was, um, I had three my pupils that did it Jamie Humphreys and Brian Streeter, Bobby Harrison. They've all gone on and had really good careers. Um, there was really good guitar players. They all wanted to do it. There was Andy Jones, who's a great guitar player, uh, uh, Andy Holsworth, Dave Holmes, Pete Callard, Hugh Davis, David Young. Um, Mike Caswell, the late Mike Caswell, he was fantastic. He was in Brian's band, um, his solo band, Nick Kendall, Simon, and then the international guys. When I did the tours later, I did Germany, the German tour, and some of the English tour, James Barber and Simon Croft, uh, Danny Gomez, Matthias Sumner, um, Mark Gillia. They're all really good. And all those players, I, I mean, I, I know I'm saying all these names, but if you look back on this and you look any of those guys up, they're, they're all really, really good oh, players. And it was a real, and they're like a family, but we all know each other. And uh, I'm not going to sit and say, you know, I'm the guy who did Wheel Rocky. I'm one of the guys who did it. There was a lot of guys who did it. And they were all all extremely competent. And, and I kind of know what it was that Brian wanted. He, he didn't actually want people to be clones of him. He wanted people who would play with an attitude and play the music respectfully and bring a bit of themselves to it, you know, because I think that's, that was quite important as well, you know. Because, I mean, when you went, there was a, the part at the end of Bowers we used to do where we could do what we wanted. And um, I always used to go off and go a bit mad. And um, he used to say to me, I love I love you doing that stuff because it's kind of, it's so unlike me, it's really refreshing. And for him to say that about his own show, and you could suggest things to him and he would do little tweaks and he would change them, you know, it felt quite good to be able to do that, you know. And a lot of times people's ego would get in the way, but it wasn't about that. He just wanted to make it great.
and they did. It was I was it was one of those things we I can't um, understate it really. When I first watched it, uh, musicians are, are a bit like they stand there like this and they go, "Yeah, it's all right." And then someone will do something that someone can't do, and they go, "It's pretty good, you know." And then it will keep going, and they'll do something incredible, and they'll be like. And that happened really on the incredible bit for me. I mean, I was watching it and I was like, this band are amazing. I mean, they're just ridiculous. And the, the longer it went on, um, the more impressed I was by it. And towards the end of the show, it was like, wow, you know, that's going to be a learn. And, and it was a real roast to do the first. I think any guitarist who did that show for the first time will tell you it, what a roast it was, you know. I mean, you, you kind of, you know, you're scratching the surface. We, we seem to be doing a lot of surface scratching today. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. That, no, the enormity, yeah. the pipeline, the requirement for, you know, the guitar is clearly a key ingredient in Queen music, you know, one of the very distinctive parts of it. Yeah. Um, the need for the right people, you know, the best people, it's uncompromising, you know, that the shows the, best, the scale. Yeah. And actually, you know, this thing wasn't, you know, it was conceived in its own right as something yeah. that had to be remarkable. And again, you, you can't help but ignore the facts. You can't help but acknowledge the facts that it ran for a very long time and is still running. Yeah, every, it, every, yeah everything about it was, was quality. I mean, and, and all the people who worked in it were there for a very long time. I mean, um, Simon Sayer, who, who was the, the, the main sound guy, he was there 12 years. You know, my, my wife, I met my wife on it. You know, and we had, you know, there was a few We Were Rocky Babies come along, like my son, you know. Um, and um, it was, it, and these people are still in touch. We're still in touch with Maz Murray and, and, and uh, Kerry Ellis and a lot of the people who we met during We Were Rocky, they're good friends, you know. And um, uh, Jenna Lee James. Kerry Ellis went, you know, has done a lot of performance, you know, moved. Uh, you know, the yeah, she does with Brian now. Yeah, another yeah. thing. Um, yeah, well, Jamie you know, Humphries went on to Brian as well. Yeah, yeah. And There's a sense yeah. of you know, so many projects in this portfolio that's enormous, that's expanded over the years. That yeah. you know, it was it was treated like a big family, but there was a hundred people in it every night, and you had a company manager, Peter Gibbon Hanson, who was just incredible the way he tied it all together. And 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 I, I normally on shows, you I mean, you know how it is. If you do tours or shows. You meet people and everyone loves each other and they're all hugging and then once it's done they go bye and you don't see them again rocky wasn't like that you know i mean you still saw people and even today i'm still in touch with people and i'm in touch with guys who get in touch with me about recently there's this uh anthem of the sea it's on a boat i think after lockdown they're, they're going out on boats doing it and he said oh you might get asked to do it um you know i'm only getting in touch because i know you're part of the rocky family and straight away he referred to it as that and it is like that with all the guitarists and all the guys because we all know what it's like to be to be in that particular you know spot and uh, it's great but it's quite hard pressured and, and you want to do a great job and you can't ask for more than that can you really no can i ask a question yeah of course uh, sorry. i'm not i'm not a musician and but what what sort of interests me is um uh and this is a this is obviously a question of somebody who is rather ignorant what you will say are the three most important um characteristics of good uh, guitarist and uh, also whether um brian may had them and uh, whether he had something on top of that you you talked about attitude and and group work and so on but yeah, you can oh, summarize yeah, yeah. It. no that's a brilliant question i mean he he what did he have i mean he he, he made that guitar of his with his dad in what in 1963 i mean i was four and as a as a thing that's that's, that's i mean simon's obviously going to talk about it so i won't too much but but what a thing to have come up with then it's just incredible and, and the, the most expensive part on it was what three quid for the pickups and i mean amazing i mean that alone and then then you've got all the influences because i think there's a british cultural thing all running through that and the jazz thing and there's lots of things taken from all over the places i can hear bits of hymns in their songs and bits of traditional stuff you hear in church music and and the way the harmony is you know the the, the, the way freddie played keyboards and and the way the, the the rock and roll Brian guitar has then got assimilated and works with the keyboards and it's just brilliant. I mean, I, it's there isn't. And, and Tim, I was listening to a bit of that. He he's, he was very he was spot on about the how the intellect involved because it's not the sort of thing that you you come up without thinking. There's real thought being put into that. 
and uh, you know quite amazing uh, back to the characteristics as far as guitarists go i mean i think you have to care about the whole picture is quite mm -hmm. important if, if you just think about i'm a guitar player and i and i care about guitar um you know, so you're only one quarter or a third of the equation aren't you you're, with brian i think he, he cared about everything it wasn't just about oh the guitar needs to be louder quite often it would be the guitar should be loud you know i know for a fact because because I said my wife Emma mixed it a, a lot and um, she was number two sound on it. And she used to say, Brian would say, well, turn the guitars down a bit. I can't hear the keyboards. Now, that's someone who really cares about the music, not somebody who wants to hear guitar. Because most guitarists are like, guitar, more, more, you know. No, it wasn't about that. It was about getting the whole thing, you know, exactly how I'd hear it, you know. And they and in Rocky, it was, it was, it was there was, uh, the guitars were panned and there were all things going on. So if you stood right in the middle of the theatre, it was always the best place to be. I just thought I'd tell you about if you ever go and watch it, because um, there's this stuff flying around. You know, I, I was going to say, you know, Brian and the other members of Queen, they were all, they all traversed different instruments. So whilst they had their yeah. principal role, so Brian's yeah. uh, sort of sensibilities towards the whole thing sounding right, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, that's clear. There will be some some songs that Brian um, wrote, played most of the instruments on uh, and sang. Um, there's a number of, you know, a lot yeah. of Queen albums have that Brian May track, which, you know, I guess there's a sense, again, I don't know, but it seems like there's a sense that Brian yeah. went off and did his thing and that, you know, and... and uh, yeah, he would come in with a, a tie your mother down or a hammer to fall or those kind of rock and roll things. But he also did um, Show Must Go On, and that's keyboards, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I think he came up with that part. I think that was that was him. So I think they all and Freddie had his guitar technique, which actually to replicate. If you, it's one of those things, it's really weird. If you're a guitar player, it's quite hard to actually play like Freddie because he had a kind of a frailing kind of style where you're just yeah. sort of hacking away, you know, kind of going like this with the back of his fingers. And most guitar players, that's alien to do because they they, they play more. You know, they they're, they're more. They're tighter than that, the way they play. They, well, they wouldn't be going. Whereas he was. Did he, did he use a pick? No, he used the back, back of his fingers yeah. like that, you know. Just, so there's nothing, it's just that, you know. I, I've got a pick under my finger, sorry. It was kind of like this. Yeah, yeah, just whacking it like that. And that's, a, it's, for a guitar player, that's quite a, it's interesting, but it's actually quite a primeval technique, if, you may, if that's not a bad thing to say. He, he's just, whacking away at it, you know, didn't care, you know. Oh, what his song. <laughs> you know. His piano um, uh, technique was very curious as well, where it was very theatrical, you know, there seemed very dramatic hand movements. The and, crossing hands in yeah. my rap, everyone, everyone remembers that. Bling, bling. Yeah. But he played also, on, you know, like underneath the, the keyboard, didn't he, really? And, yeah. Did he used to play behind his head as well? Uh, and there was a thing, he, he had a piano in, in bed when he would write and he'd sort of do that. I mean, you know, I don't, was told. you know, we're, 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 we're tr you know, approaching this from an academic perspective. So you yeah. kind of, you know, we, you, you know, our aim is to kind of be objective, but it's yeah. very hard to kind of not find yourself talking about these remarkable things in a, uh, you know, well, uh, you know, I mean, certainly a respectful way, but an appreciative way as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. and there's so many, dimensions as well yeah, there is i mean i mean there's still more stuff about the guitarist qu uh, question as well to, i mean the the it's kind of assumed on, on shows like that that you don't go in there and kind of show off that's the, you know because people aren't going to be that impressed because they're all good so yeah. you, you could don't go in there and play your latest lick and go look at this and expect them to go oh wow you're amazing because they'll go yeah okay they could all do that so they expect you to kind of be nice be on time not have an ego do a great job you know, be, be, be pleasant, but play with, with fire and passion and, and, and a bit of attitude, you know. And if you've got that, and it's about, for guitarists particularly, it's about having good vibrato in your left hand. You know, mm -hmm. that was a real big thing, you know, because if you don't, there's no personality in what you play. Do you think that this type of um, guitar playing belongs to a certain age? Or is it sort of like... Um, yeah, uh, universal yeah. Or, or you know uh, and a related question to that do you um do you think that uh 
Brian's, uh, Brian May's um, guitar playing influenced new uh, generations of British musicians or? Oh, definitely. Not? Yeah, there's no doubt that he influenced, he influenced people. The, the whole the whole thing he got was unique, the combination. I mean, I think there's a slight, and he, he gives respect to Rory Gallagher about the fact of seeing him use a Vox and liking that sound. He had a range mastery, he liked that sound. I mean, even the fact that Rory was writing riffs like, um, uh, and then Brian goes, you know, there's similarities, there's parallels. It's not the same, but but it's it's a nod in that direction, and uh, nothing comes from from no, you know has to be influenced by something. And I think Brian definitely had a bit of influence from from Rory. Um, so, and then obviously in turn, people like myself and all the other guitar players, you know, look up to Brian, and, you know, and Rory, and you know, because I always like to see where everything's come from, so you kind of go back down the line and see how far you can get, you know, and you end up with blues guys but i think the prevailing thing the difference between modern people perhaps is they he knew the value of a note and a melody i mean you know it's it's, it's some of it's not that technical but it just sounds fantastic and his touch you know i mean to, to kind of play i hate saying that look at his touch and then i'll go and do something and it won't be but um but he was very not only the good day young do you know the, the, It's very, very sensitive. You know, that's not someone who's whacking away at the guitar. It's someone who's just trying to fit in with the vocal. You know, you're hearing it on its own, so it's a bit strange. But, but it's it's really fits. It's made for the song. You know, and I think a lot of the solos um, are composed anyway. They they fall into two camps broadly in my mind. You've got the ones where you've got a chord sequence, and then you have to think about it. What can you do? I mean, even crazy little thing called love. I think that's been really thought about because. You're not going to improvise jam that really because um on the face of it it's a bit of rock and roll but it changes key and it, it goes in a kind of a, 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 a way you don't expect so you have to follow the chords you know which is what he does um and that, that prevails pretty much throughout his playing you know and the, the amount of time i bet he he spent it's hard to reverse engineer it after the event but i, I have a feeling that um and from speaking to him that they, they spent a lot of time on that stuff i mean i can remember um, attention to detail. I can remember a rehearsal with myself, Andy Jones, Pete Callard, I think, were there, and Brian. And it, it was, the, I used to do Seven Seas of Ryan C on Wheel Rocky. And the last three notes, when it goes, um, take me to the Seven Seas of, you know, right at the end. Um, so the, the harmony for that, it was like one guitar do one thing, the other guitar do another. And I think the other guitar was going, was playing that and then we spent ages working out what the, the other one the other the other harmony should be and it ended up with it staying still in the first two notes and then so you ended up with you ended up with that um and that's just, that's the attention to detail that's three notes and that's keep that's four people and a band um there for an hour which is not a cheap thing to do because everyone's getting paid um but at the end of it he's really happy because it's like that's right that's how it should be you know uncompromising yeah to no, it, totally it, it was interesting as well that you know there's somebody's made a comment about uh you know in in the in the chat that i, I thought was very interesting when we were talking about freddie and the crossing over um thing uh said a piano teacher um said that was bad technique but th there's this also this idea i, I mean there were other dimensions to conceiving that one of them would have been the sort of theatrics, you know, there's so many forces at play here. Yeah. But the thing that I find, you know, particularly, you know, or one of the things I find particularly interesting is um, not following rule book, you know, how, we're talking about a band who actually were re, re you know, sort of you know, looking at things with, you know, coming from new angles and, yeah. Yeah, doing yeah. things that hadn't been done before um yeah. yeah i mean the whole kind of you know brian playing with the sixpence thing and the the, the trouble booster i get from rory the vox yeah. but then there was then there was the guitar which is unique so you know you're going to talk to simon about it so i won't turn his toes cool. but um but the, the sixpence it's like 
I guess it was the only thing that was lying around. He didn't have any plectrums. Mm. And then he thought, oh, that sounds nice. That sounds quite glassy. You know, I mean, I had to, I mean, and now, I, honestly, I could show, I could, for anyone who's watching who's not used to, to understand what it does, is that a, a, a normal guitar would be like that. If you hit it with a sixpence, it's kind of, it's got this kind of glassy sort of thing going on. And especially, it, it, it does take, you know, to actually recognize that that is something novel, but it really works. Oh, it really, if you, on Chuggy Calls, if you're doing, say, in Now I'm Here, when he's, when you're doing that, if I use a normal plectrum, it's different. Compared to that, it's got more, like, rasp. I more. All that sort of stuff. And then it's straight, when you're doing anything that's got a, a, a rhythm, um, this you've got this the, the serration on the coin will give you this kind of like, um, and you hear that all over the place. You know, and you can't do it a normal, normal pick. It would just be, it would just be straight like that. So. Where that came from, no idea. As I say, I think it might have been just there was a sixpence lying around. I'll try it, and then you get down to the, actually the old ones sound a bit better than the new ones. <laughs> it's um, I think it's just being curious, isn't it? And and being you know investigating everything you can to to try and improve what you're doing. You know, yeah, um, there's you know. Huge, huge numbers of things all in dialogue here, aren't that? You know the yeah. you know there must be a massive complexity in the thinking, you know, in the processes to sort of arrive at all of these and, you know, the, the level of detail, again, um, that seems to be present in everything that, you know, Brian, well, that Queen did, really. Yeah, is. some of it was probably necessity. I mean, back then, there wasn't any channel switching amps mm -hmm. and you didn't have 127 patches at your feet of different sounds and modelling this, modelling that like you have now. There was like one amp, one channel, one sound, and you either played it louder or quieter. So then to get any sort of variance, you would have to change the pickups, how you play, where you played, and the volume control. I mean, Brian's clean sound was the guitar just about on, so it was kind of... Now that sound, if I turn it up to about three or four, it's gone crunchy now, so it's... And if I turn it up flat out, it's for soloing, you know. It'll do all the so it'll be great for any kind of, you know. It'd be great for that. So that's just on one pickup three different sounds and then you've actually got as i say i've got to talk about how this works but you basically got the main sound was those two pickups and they're in phase but then you can make them go out of phase you can you can switch each pickup individually you get lots of combinations that do that do different things you know and and tony it just nearly changed it into another guitar you know if you, if you had the two outside pickups there and um and then you um make this one you know rever reverse it you, you it goes really wiry and kind of you get that kind of sound you know and then if you go into the front pickup and you put it back in phase um that's quite mellow you know quite fairly um for doing stuff like turn up a bit You know, for that sort of stuff uh and then the most radical one and it was a real shock to me and it will sound probably a little bit odd um like this but if you have the front two pickups uh there and then you reverse the uh, polarity of that one um what will happen the phase of that one um what will happen it, it they kind of cancel each other out so normally that's quite bassy like it was on killer queen but it goes really bright and actually accentuates all the upper harmonics and that's what he used for bohemian rhapsody now, the first time i'd ever tried to do it it was like is there something wrong but then you do it with the band and it sounds right and it's really really kind of um it sounds like i'm pinching harmonics it sounds like you're trying to but you just it's like thin and wiry i don't think that comes across like, on this but um yeah. Yeah. Well, 
that played a wrong note. I mean, who, <laughs> who who could think, who could conceive such a thing? It's quite remarkable, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean that. It's the fact of how it cuts through because it's so, it's so. Um, yeah, and, and it goes. And then you, if you go back to the normal sound by comparison, um, you know, if you if you're doing say, you know, that's a lot fatter sounding, you know, compared to. And if I put, change the pickup again, you know, go back to this. You can know how bright that is by comparison, and, and that's genius. I mean, that's really a lot of thought gone into it. And he's thought about all the variables and how you could actually make it work. You know, mm. fantastic, fantastic. Um, yeah. Phil, you know, the, the other thoughts. Are, I mean, obviously, it's great to get this insight into We Will Rock You, which in itself was a phenomenon. Um, uh, there's a bit of a sort of pattern there, isn't there, really, with these uh, these things that, um, you know, Queen do. Um there were other you've done other things queen related things yeah wow. yeah i mean yeah because what happened after after we were we finished in london i went and did it in i'm looking at my dates again now i went and did it in munich from 2014 to 2015 with jamie humphreys and then there was um an ongoing thing in sweden called champions of rock that i did tours in 2009 uh 2010 2015 2000 uh yeah i think that was about it and uh, but they were they started off as theater and then ended up being in arenas they were huge gigs in the end and uh neil murray did it and jamie humphreys and tony bork so there's a lot of the and Jenna Lee james kerry did it the, the first two carry this and maz murray did it so it was kind of you know and there was a few other outside events as well using the rock you people and then uh in 2019 and eight, 2018 and 19, I did Tom Chaplin doing Queen, which we did for Friday night, his music night for the BBC. And uh, then we did a short tour on the back of that with Leo Green and uh, an orchestral kind of thing. And that was with Alan Darby playing guitar and myself. And that was excellent. I mean, Tom did a brilliant job of being Freddie, you know, unbelievable. Mm. Yeah, you know, when we first started rehearsing, it was like, wow, you know, really, really good. I'd, I'd heard him do a hard life with Brian and Brian at some uh, charity thing. Mm -hmm. but I just didn't realize he was that good at it. You yeah. Know? Um, but uh, I, he would have certainly got my, I mean, Paul Rogers, I, I'm not going to get into what I thought of that or, or, or anything else. But I think if you want someone who would, could sing the old st stuff well, it would have been someone like Tom for me, definitely, mm. you know. Um, but there I mean, again, it, was great, you know, it was great that, um, you know, I think Paul Rogers afforded us another Queen album, didn't he? You know, he did. Yeah. 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 Which was, um, you know, great to hear, you know, those core, core elements coming together, albeit with a different singer, uh, with, it, with his own style. Um, and, and of course, it got them on the road again as well, didn't it? Which, uh, yeah, I can, I can remember when that happened, actually. Um, yeah, I can remember Brian took because I, I do obviously done a lot of magazine stuff, a lot of transcriptions and stuff. So he 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 would sometimes even Spike Edney would sometimes ask certain things about songs, you know. And that one in particular, they were going to do a charity thing with Paul Rogers, and he said, um, he "said All right, now he said, is there two guitars on that?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, they're, they're doing slightly different things, one each side." And he said, "What are they doing?" And I remember at his party, and he's got, you know, I've got his head, my head stuck to his ear, so he could hear over the talking. And I'm talking about one guitar that was low there, <laughs> which incidentally, that's all right now. And Hammond to Fall is <laughs> and all right now. Is mm. Similar things. Um, again, it's just rock and roll vocabulary because you can take that back to the, the Wanderer going. <laughs> Play it quiet, and you get days of our lives. But you know, I mean, in reality, or sorry, sorry to talk over you. One right. thing that what we're talking about is significant, significant developmental steps. Yeah, yeah. And a process of evolution. Yeah. Um, and reusing you know, material that, that had been in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different light from uh, that had been used before, which is I mean, it's, what it's, people it's do. Just, sorry. I guess it's impossible to conceive something. With, that isn't in some way informed by something else um, musically. Uh, there's only so many. Um, yeah, but I think with with things like you know we, we're talking about with with the, the big one with Bo Rap. I mean, no one had done that. No. I mean, I, I'm listening to that and I'm thinking, you know, I've never heard anyone do you know, and all these calls. I've never heard anyone anyone 
play play that in in a, in a rock song you know like in, and the whole way it was constructed the way it was put together and to have a rock and roll bit in it that's in sort of you know that, that starts on an e flat for most guitar players are like what it's, it's the wrong key and a lot of their stuff's in keys that you wouldn't you know they're not guitaristic i mean brian's stuff you know hammer to fall and um one vision they're in a and d and you know and you know in your in those in e and i'm just thinking of examples off the top of my head but, but under pressure being in d they're kind of they're guitar keys are guitar friendly but there's a whole lot of stuff that really isn't in guitar friendly keys that, that they, obviously I, started on life on on a keyboard yeah and they broke a lot of rules didn't they you know i think you know yeah. it's becoming more and more apparent as you yeah, know we totally. sort of dig deeper uh, but they did it very tastefully you know all of these uh, you know and sometimes they're subtle sometimes they're profound yeah um you know uh but in the over they're all contributory to the overall picture of the specialness of what queen yeah is. totally unique yeah uh you know and i think that's come out a, a lot in in what you've been saying phil which is a, again another really fascinating insight when we're trying to sort of understand you know to you know, if you want to be successful, you know, uh, case studies and role models that have been successful are a great thing to look at, aren't they? You know, oh, and definitely, I yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you know, everyone's got influence, and uh, and you know, no one is, you know, no musician is an island, are they? They they have to kind of absorb f from all around them, and it's how they interpret that. But I think some people just do a lot more with it, and 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 put their neck on the line, really. You know, because mm. I, I there's so many people who are who are kind of about to write their own record, but never do. But they they did a body of work, and they they spent. A, I think now it would be very hard for a, a band to be able to spend that much time on, on a record that was paid for by the record company. But perhaps mm. nowadays there's enough people who who because of the internet can get hopefully discovered because they've got the time to, that Queen had because it, all they need is a computer now so they don't actually need to, to have access to Trident Studios or anything like that. Um, I, I remember a story of a friend of mine who, who went in to do his band's album and Queen were next door and I think Queen were, were doing a couple of songs and they finished their album and it was mixed and out and Queen was still in there working. They'd just been you know, because not because they they're slow, because they want to go through every variable and find out what's what and live with it. And but that must be, have something has to be must, right. Must have something to do with the profound legacy as well that they conceived and took so much care on. You know their their output. Yeah, um, totally. that it, it you know has contributed to its enduring nature. Um, yeah, I, th I think you have to you have to take care of your your, your catalogue, don't you? I mean, you know, I mean, I know the anthemic stuff like Champions and all the rest of it. They use for adverts because they're they're pretty good for a hook, aren't they? As well for for coming up with a, a it's one of those things where they'll come up with a saying like you know we will rock you or we are the champions or you know uh, those sort of songs, and and you think oh anyone could have written that, but the trouble is they didn't. Yeah, you know, and they're, they're the people. I don't know. I think it's only obvious in retrospect. Uh, because, but they're common you know. sayings, aren't they? If I said, you know, I want it all. I mean, that's kind of it's just a, a, a nearly a throwaway sentiment. And you, but but it takes a different mindset to then go, I want it all. That's a great title for a song, mm. and then be able to construct something around it, and you know, I want it all, and then put a melody around it and a cool progression, and and turn it into something that becomes part of the backdrop of everyone's lives. I mean, there's a massive chain of process going on there from the initial someone sitting around saying, you know, do you know, what? I really want it all to that being out, you know, mm. and being a finished work, well, piece of art, basically. I, I do, I just, you know, I do think that, and this is an opinion that we look back, we can look back on these things and, you know, whilst they may seem obvious, it's only really because they've, infused our consciousness and actually to to grab hold of it in the first place and say let's do that you know we will rock you you know as you said you, you said no one else did it no one else thought well, it, but they it kind of it seems really obvious in retrospect mm. and, and, and it's very easy for someone to to kind of accuse it of being oh we will rock you that's a bit bland you know it isn't because there was, anyone could have done it but they didn't you know it's that is the i wish i thought of it I'll it's be the main, but i wish i'd have thought of it as well <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm moving the, tomorrow. <laughs> you know, imagine the royalties. But, you know, yeah. the other thing is that the music's very functional. You know, there's... Well, there's so many dimensions, but some of it is incredibly functional, isn't it? You know, some of it really lends itself to... Um, it, it's got that... I think I, I read the description somewhere. It's got that thing about it that, like, people are cheering for a football match, mm. but there's only one team, and that team happens to be Queen. Mm. And so, therefore, if, you, if you've got We Will Rock You and everyone's punching the, the air and going, you know, we will, we will, and they're all playing. <laughs> and there's doof, doof, gaff, bluff, bluff, you know. It's just, it's infectious and it becomes part of people's lives. And, and then, you know, I would imagine Brian gets sent videos of children singing We Will Rock You. I did it to him when George was born and he's singing along to it. Wah, wah, wah. I, I can imagine... He gets thousands and thousands of children, sing, you know, singing along with those songs, you know. Um, you know, Radio Gaga, another one. Um, and well, this we, stuff is, is just priceless. Phil, very regrettably, we've run out of time. Have we? Again. Oh, that was quick. But, uh, well, we've got Simon Bradley, who's, uh, you know, I know, Simon. I know you're good friends with. Give him my love. Um, but I, I was just going to say that the... Um, Another sort of point, again, that I think is really worth bringing into sharp focus, which you've made, was this idea of the social, you know, pe people coming together and being able to share, you know, this social um, experience that is uniting of yeah. you know, people. And, uh, you know, that's, a you know, again, something that strikes me about Queen music and something that they were particularly good at. Oh, they really strike a, a human chord with a lot of people. I mean, if you go and watch them and you see Brian singing The Love of My Life, I mean, everyone's had a love of their life. Mm. And every person watching can relate to it in their own way. And that's what music's about, surely. You know, mm. that it actually, you know, hits the spot. And they, they definitely do that, I'm sure, you know. Simon's there. Can you hear me, Simon? Hello. Hi, Simon. Hello, mate. <laughs> yes, I can. Thank you. Hi, Tone. All right. I'm sorry, we've, we've been running behind um, most of the day uh, due to one technical problem that became another technical pro you know but I, I, you know I, I, from what i can see uh the the audience the people who are watching are um you know enjoying and really getting into uh, the spirit of the occasion uh you know making some great comments and um awesome. uh, you know talk, you know talking amongst themselves as well about you know some things that you know we've got got some great people out there uh maybe that's another thing that queen fans are um, are brilliant people as well, you know, but... Um... Oh, they are. And the whole, I mean, Simon will, will bear me out on this, the whole team connecting them. And the one person I didn't mention was Pete Manandrone, who's Brian's tech, and he was so helpful to us on the tour and in Rock U, and, and I'm sure he's been massive help to Simon doing his book and everything. These people, yep. they're, they're not, you know, they're just good human beings, and that's all mm. you want to be surrounded by, you know, with that sort of thing, to, to make it work. You know. Indeed, indeed. Bill, you know, again, another point, putting teams together. Yeah. Of people who, who can, uh, you know, make great things happen, uh, you know, people with different skill sets. And yeah. that's and, probably, and people, you know, people, people who, kind of, who, who do what they say they're going to do. Mm. You know, can you do so and so? Oh, I'm not very good at that. OK, I won't do it. Or, or, you know, can you do that? Yes, I think I can do it. And then you go and do it and you give it your best shot. And, you know. That, that's that's a good way of, 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 of being in that way. You surround yourself with people who, who elevate the product, hopefully. Yeah. And great advice to anyone looking to work in and around the music business. Do what you say you're going to do. Yeah, uh, and don't take on things that you that you really can't because it, you'll come unstuck. You yeah. know? Um, but I think if, you, if, you're, if you're honest about what you can do and, and, and you, you give it your best shot and you turn up on time and you haven't got an attitude, I think you'd hopefully be in employment. You know, I mean, I've got away with it for a long time, so it's all right. <laughs> but, well, you, you, both of you have worked, you know, with the best of the best in the world, you know, and, and um, you know... It's, it's very um, odd because from the inside, you're not really thinking of it like that. After a while, it, it just... I mean, and, and again, Simon will bear me out on this. After a while, he's just bright, you know, he's, he's like someone you know, and it's kind of, you know, 
you, you just dare to do what you do. And I don't think people like that really want people who are going to be, <coughs> you know, all creepy and um, what's the word, <laughs> sycophantic around them. They don't want that, do they really? No. I, I'd hate it. Can you imagine that? You know, everything you do, you know, can you pass me sugar? Oh, you're amazing. <laughs> I, I, do you know what? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't mind that. it. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's how my, my family treat me. So, no, I'm yeah, only yeah, boy. <laughs> definitely they don't. Um, this has been great fun. So, brilliant. I, well, I, thank I, you so I much. We, we've run it. over a bit, but Simon, apologies. Um, hey, no problem. So much great stuff to talk about. So much important stuff. Phil, thanks very much. No, and no um, my pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you. We'll catch you again soon. Yeah, I'll see you soon, Philbert. See you soon, Philborn. See you later. Bye. Cheers, buddy. Bye bye. So, press something. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, uh, hello. Great to see you. Uh, yeah, you too, mate. Much, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I don't don't think you've met ever uh, before. I've uh, not known colleague, um, but you know she has a habit of asking brilliant questions, so uh, it's great okay. to have her here. Um, but I, I think probably the, the the best thing for me to do to start off is to kind of introduce you. Um, the you you came onto my radar as uh, somebody who. Um, co-wrote the uh, book on the red special um mm -hmm. which is uh with with brian may um yeah. which is quite a remarkable um element to queen and their sound and uh unique in you know it, well it is whilst there are copies of it made it is still very much unique in many ways and in the process of writing the book, you actually saw the guitar taken apart, didn't you? Um... Well, yeah, that that actually was my idea. I mean, we were pitching all sorts of ideas. And like Phil was saying with We Were Rocky, Brian was involved all the way through. Because I was just expecting him to say, well, yeah, you go off and do it and I'll put my name on it and that'll be that. But with anything that he sets his mind to, um, he wants to be fully involved from day one. And he was on this. And he was always, he had always wanted to write a book on the guitar and he wanted to write it himself. But because he didn't have the time and everything, this is after Freddie had gone, mm. um, but he didn't, just didn't have, he never got round to it. I mean, he's an incredibly busy man, as everybody alludes to, and he's got so much going on that it just never got, it never got finished. It never got, well, it never got started, to be honest. He made a plan, but that was about it. But um, I just happened to pitch the idea to the aforementioned Pete Malinger at just the right time. Mm. And uh, we were managed to take off and, and it's proved a quite a really good success, which I'm very proud of, I must say. So, again, you know, we're always trying to grab hold of things that can, you know, make a difference uh, as educators yeah. um, to, you know, future music people. Uh, timing, uh, I think there is an, it's one, you know, a really important point um you know that, that you make there uh you, you know yeah. it was pitched at the right time the right moment mm. uh to the right person as uh you know pete malandrone who Quite. i mean you you previously uh you know you, you're an expert on guitars you've written journalistically about uh, guitars and guitar players uh for a long time yeah uh and you'd actually um written about brian i, I believe before you you did, you did this uh, before the book venture? Oh, very, very much so. I was on Guitarist magazine from 1996 to two. I've written it down because I always forget 2013. Mm -hmm. Or was it 2014? This is the thing I can never remember. 2013, I think it was 17 years. And, you know, that working on the mag was an ideal, was an ideal job because I joined in 96 and it was before the internet. It was before digital this and before streaming that. It was when people would go and buy a copy of the magazine every three weeks and uh, sit in their bedrooms and read it. And I, I was one of those. I was one of those soldiers. And Phil used to and still does work guitarist. But at the, at the time, sort of the mid 90s, Phil was guitarist magazine. He really was. He had various editors who were great. Neville Martin, Eddie Allen, people like that, who are great, excellent journos and really good blokes as well. Great writers. But, uh, you know, you needed to have the personality out on the road. And I don't mean that those guys didn't have personality, but they were more running the team, mm. whereas Phil and other guys were able to get out there. And that's where I first got to know, got to hear of Phil. He's a great player and a real mentor to lots of people, as he was saying. Mm. 
And then um, I, I was working at a hotel at that time in Birmingham. And I just had one, one of those days that I just really hated it more than normal. And I remember, I remember writing it down on a bit of paper, what I would like, what I would really like to do, hmm. um, you know, with no holds barred. And top of the list was Right for Guitarist magazine, believe it or not. Wow. So I just got the yellow pages, which is what you did in those days, kids, and rang hmm. and rang them. And I, I was told I didn't have anything like enough experience. So I thought, well, OK, fair enough. So I, I got another, I can't, I, sorry, I got a copy of the yellow pages, as I say, but rang all the music stores in Birmingham. And the second one I managed to... Uh, get a job there but that again was ringing at just the right time because that was on a friday afternoon and the guy a guy in the guitar department was leaving and they were desperately trying to find somebody to take over and again recruiting was putting ads in the back of the papers rather than putting stuff on indeed and letting all hell break loose so i joined them i joined the, the the shop for five years got a real inside knowledge um of guitars and how it works and made a lot of contacts that i'm still friends with today um, guys at Yamaha and Marshall and Fender US and uh, they, they were distributed by a company called Arbiter at the time yeah. which is neither here nor I think they were honestly my memory is just hopeless what am I doing? Am I awake? anyway <laughs> so um, I thought a friend of mine offered me a job on a writing on a fitness magazine would you believe? A pause for laugh whenever I say that because the thought of me working on a fitness magazine is ridiculous I did that for a year and what that enabled me to do, not, not by coincidence and design, well, how it was have the perfect mix of experience that guitarists were after. Mm. Uh, retail experience, product, oh, drop your phone, retail experience, product knowledge, and, um, excuse me, you know, customer service as well up to a point because readers were very much customers in those days and still are, I suppose. So I rang them again and they said, well, yeah, maybe they were a bit off. They were a bit offish, but I managed to buy a copy of the magazine, and there was an advert in there that says, "Would you like to come and join the team?" And I thought, right. So I wrote. Um, they wanted a review of your own guitar, which was a, a Takamine acoustic at those days, and also a fantasy interview with the guitarist of your choice. Now, at that time, I was guitar teching for a band called Magnum. Mm. Throws horns for Magnum, who the a huge band in their day they were their audience was more selective by this stage so i managed to do an interview with their guitarist who's a great guy called tony clarkin so it was an ab it was a real interview rather than one made up with Jimi hendrix or you know i would have done an interview with brian may to be honest with you yeah. so i got the job uh, in this was uh, march 1996 and then the first time i interviewed brian was in 1998 although it's interesting pete um phil talking about Pastor Sugar, you're lovely, because that's exactly what I was like. I just sat there mute while Neville Martin, who was the editor of, the, of Guitarist magazine, um, and Brian spoke because they were mates. And I just sat there like a, like a mute fan. Mm. It's very strange. But that's the first time I met him, and I got to know Pete then. And as I say, Pete was instrumental in, in setting the whole, the whole book thing up. It was brilliant. Real dream come true, it really was. Yeah, I guess it was a, a bunch of circumstances coming together. You know, Brian had you know wanted to do it you know he mm. had that idea and this became a solution um uh, and everything came together um yep. but i mean the, the guitar itself uh most people watching this will probably know but um you know there is only whilst there are copies made and uh brian this the brian may guitar company that makes wonderful guitars that are yeah. uh, you know are brilliant to play uh, and in fact there's been a number of incarnations of you know replicas or copies yeah but um there are things there is only one i mean the red special was a name that came at a later point in time wasn't it, it was almost like it needed a name uh, it, was it called the old lady before that. Well, I don't think I don't. Yeah, Brian, I'm not sure Brian's very keen on the old lady. He said that he, it's slightly disrespectful. I think he said right. in the past. I think he just used apologies, to use apologies. No, no, no. I don't think he's worried about that too much. Um, but I think it was a. Uh, he just used to call it my guitar, the mm. guitar. And mm. I think it's just. I'm not sure whether who first coined the red special name. I'm sure it was him. But it's a good name for it, it is, because. Yeah. It's, it's truly unique. And everything that you guys and we are all talking about today is pretty special. Without 
all those guitar notes that we hear, um, well, 99.9% of them, coming from guitar that he made on a workbench with his dad on the kitchen table and in the shed and in the garden of their, of their house in Felton between, when was it, 62 and 64, which finished in October 64. I mean, it's hardly quite, played, quite it's staggering. Not, it is. He's hardly played anything. I mean, the thought of a guitarist having one guitar that is almost all they've played, uh, and certainly on, on yeah. the records. Uh, am I right in thinking that? I would say so. I'm not totally au fait with what he used in his, in his career in the 90s. There's lots of guys on the Red Special Forum, hello everyone, who are much more expert in that sort of side of it. But from what I would say, he would only use another guitar when he just couldn't get a sound out of the Red Special, the right, the right sound. So the most obvious one is the 12-string on Long Away, which is on um, Day at the Races. The, the solo is obviously him through the Deke amps because it's all multi-layered. But the intro riff is a 12-string, which is a Burns 12-string that he still owns. Mm -hmm. Another famous one is obviously a crazy little thing called Love, which he used a, an Esquire that was that's Roger Taylor's, although Brian has it at his place now. It's a 1967 Fender Esquire, which is basically a Telecaster, but without the neck pickup although this one does have a neck pickup because lots of them were customised either in the factory or by previous owners. Yeah. And I think on, on Mother Love, he played either a Parker Fly or an or a Ibanez Joe Satriani. I can't remember which one it is. I think it's a Satriani, but I might be wrong. And there's probably other little bits and pieces here and there, but the vast majority of all the famous solos are made on that guitar, were played on that guitar. And although... Fan, fans of the music won't necessarily be interested in the guitar that any any player will have. Mm. But it, you know, if you're looking at guitarists of the similar stature, Hendrix, uh, Jimmy Page, Clapton, they've all used different types of guitars. You know, Hendrix had there's pictures of him with a with a flying V, the Monterey flying V, the Strat, mm. of course, and you know, a black Les Paul custom as well. But Brian has only ever used that the Red Special and Anger, and it's it's. It's even after all this time, and I've played it many times and just sort of looked at it in my hands and like some sort of holy relic. Mm. Um, needless to say, I sound like me through it, whereas he sounds like him playing anything. Um, but it's quite, it's quite staggering. And the scientific application that they lent to the design, which is outlined in the book, which is why part of the book looks like a maths, like a maths annual, mm. um, is amazing. And that's what's the, that's what's, that is what's unique about it. Mm -hmm. Most people, I'm including myself in this, would say, well, I'm going to make a guitar. So you buy the bits online, you put it together, it either works or it doesn't. And then you go, OK, that's fine. Or you cut out of a breadboard or something. But the physics of the string, the, the amount of pulling power that the strings have on that neck, is quite staggering on any electric guitar. So having something like a truss rod in there, if I was going to build a guitar when I was 14, I wouldn't have had the first clue of what that was. Mm -hmm. But they did. And they designed their own truss rod. It, it's quite unbelievable. The only bits that they didn't make themselves were the tuning pegs, which had been replaced many, many, many times, and the pickups. But they even then they tried. They had a stab at making their own pickups in the in the first instance. And the first gig that they played, that he played with them, with the with the. I'm sorry. The first gig he played with those pickups in the guitar. Um, they squealed so much and he did he still doesn't know why it's something to do with the magnetic polarity of the pole pieces i think but he's not sure and if he's not sure i've got no idea that's why no, he went no, and no one them. no one's sure if, if Brian's well no there. one's sure even to this day um so sorry sure. just, what, what where did that that was that the first set of pickups i've sort of lost the linearity of of of, of that part of the story well, he made they they knew they needed pickups and they knew how it works. It's a it's a, a metal, metallic string, a metal string, vibrating in a magnetic field produces a piezo electro electro piezo current. I think that's right, um, and that's what's that's what's amplified by the amplifier. Put simply, so they knew the theory of it. They built their own winding machine yeah. because the signal has to go around copper wire, which is wrapped around the bobbin, and there are many thousands and thousands of turns of this copper wire mm. which allows the signal to be to be produced efficiently so they knew the theory but they didn't quite have the the well technical know-how i suppose mm. 
mm. um, to put it together. Whereas these days, if you've got a new guitar, you go and buy bespoke pickups. You go to Bare Knuckle and buy their pickups mm. or anybody else's, or they'll buy Bare Knuckles because they're the best ones. Um, but they decided that they couldn't couldn't work. The the squealing was too much to bear. So that's what's made. That's why he went and bought the, the Burns Trisonics that were, I think they were nine guineas, I think, something like that. Three quid, as Phil said, is probably about right. But they're the same pickups that are in there. They're the same pickups that he's had in there since 1963, 1964. It is, quite, it is quite ridiculous. And there's only so much maintenance that, that pickups can have mm. because he filled the cavity within them with araldite to lower their microphonic squealing. Mm. And so, yeah, I don't think you could take the covers off even if you wanted to. Mm. Quite, quite outstanding. Sorry, I've got a really dry throat at the moment. So apologies. No, no, it's it's fascinating, Simon. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, you're really talking about its uniqueness, aren't you? Um, though, mm. I, you know, that in itself presented a, a, a problem because you know, for for people who like the music, um, yeah. because you couldn't, you know, you couldn't really get a sound like Brian May. I, I think, you you know, clearly one of the things that has come out is his playing style is a profound, you know, has a profound impact on how he sounds and, you know, the musicality and everything, doesn't it? But... Uh, um, well, yeah, I mean, that goes that goes for any guitar player or any, any player of any stringed instrument, to be honest. Um, I think what's unique about how he plays there's all sorts of things that nobody else does it's mm. the sixpence with a pick which is a major part of the sound mm. um the metallic edge that he has stroking it using the serrated edge to get out the pinched harmonics or turning it the other way so it's flat so it's a softer sound you know he did he's told me he does that instinct he did that instinctively back in the day but the way that he the way that he has the way that he's developed his sound and how he gets his sound over the years is amazing because it's basically the same as ever it was, mm. although these days it benefits from modern technology, so it's so much more reliable. Mm. And I think, he, I think it's sounding better than ever. Mm. It's basically a thing called the treble booster, which as it's, does exactly what it says on the tin, which goes into the guitar. The way that the switching is in the guitar, the pickups are wired in series, so what's you've got one, two, three, and the, the, the signal goes through each one in turn and is slightly amplified. Each time. Amplified isn't the right word. It's given more power, let's say, by, for each one. So if you have all three on at the same time, that's the maximum power that the guitar has. Now, a Fender Stratocaster, which has three single coils, mm. which are broadly the same as Trisonics, very broadly, but they don't sound anything like them. Mm. That's most, they're mostly wired in parallel. So that means they're on at the same time, but the signal is going through them at the same time rather than the trisonics. Chuck that into a Vox AC30, which is on full blast. And if you have an AC30 on full blast without a treble booster, it sounds really horrible. It's flabby and farting. It sounds really not very pleasant at all. But, but with use of the treble booster, which boosts the treble, plus the unique acoustic characteristics that the guitar has, because it's not semi-hollow like a, an acoustic guitar is or a 3, 3 Gibson 335 3, is, but does have acoustic pockets, which helps with the sound. It's the fact that two of the three pickups are mounted on the same piece of mahogany that makes the neck. That makes all sorts of difference. And that's before you get to the fact that he's one of the most articulate players of the electric guitar ever. Mm. And then they've got all, the, all that music that they did and all those fantastic sounds that he got out. It's just, it's just part of the it's just part of the uniqueness of the band that everybody that we're all discussing and you know not you know, if you're a fan you don't necessarily need to know that he built the guitar by himself and to be honest with you if they if he hadn't you no know, if, if if he wasn't so technically able him and his father he would have bought a few strats and you know they still would have been the biggest band in the world because I think their rise to the top was unstoppable irrelevant of what of the guitar that he was playing because he would have worked out a way of finding those sounds another way using different like everybody else does using different guitars and different amps and different eqs and different this and different that whereas his sound has totally come from a you know, homemade guitar into either an ac30 at full blast or this deke amp 
which John Deacon made out of bits allegedly found in a skip, uh, which he uses for a lot of the orchestration sounds, uh, the orchestration constructions that he does. And again, okay. a homemade a homemade guitar into a homemade amp with a with a Dallas Range Master treble booster mm. is is beggar's belief even today when I'm when we're talking about it. May I chip I in just... again? Oh. Yes, hello, sure. chip in. I, I, I uh, again with my ignorant questions. That's okay. Uh, because I'm not a musician or even musicologist, um, but um, you know, um, Queen wasn't just a rock band it's also described as sort of post rock band or pop rock band so my question is whether this um style of guitar playing also contributed to this shift more towards pop music because i feel like the way you describe it and compare it with jimmy page for example it's all very much within the realm of rock Mm. So my question is, you know, was it something pop about it which made Queen kind of different from the Zeppelin or, you know, or um, um, Pink Floyd or whatever? Well, I th I, if we're comparing those, I think pop, for me, translates, translates as having melody. Now, I'm certainly not saying that Floyd and Zeppelin don't have melodies, because of course they do. But if you listen, the perfect example is Killer Queen, which is not the breakthrough single, but it was certainly the one that I remember hearing first. Now, the melodies on that, and it's one of his best guitar solos as well. So I'm not, I don't think Killer Queen, you know, Freddie sings it beautifully. It's a, such a rich song, the construction in there, the layers, even, the, you know, even the story by the lyrics are very absorbing. Is that pop music? It's difficult to think of pop music in 74, 75, and with, with today's pop music ringing in our ears or not. Um, but I think having an electric, a, a lot of bands had electric guitars in those days. And he was the one who used it most uniquely in a most musical way. Because, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin are certainly not a pop band. They were the original heavy metal band, them and Black Sabbath. And there's plenty of melodies. If you listen to War Pigs by Black Sabbath, that's not a pop song. But that's got a melody that you cannot get out of your head. And it's the same with it's the same with Killer Queen. It's just different ways of employing the electric guitar. <coughs> excuse me, for getting your mute one's musical point across. And because all four of the band members by the time Killer Queen came out um, had written songs, I think Roger, uh, Bro sorry, John had only written Misfire by that stage, but they were all very headstrong and very dedicated to getting the music as good as it possibly could be. And they all wanted to play their part. I'm going to call, I'm, I do apologize. I've got some tickly throat thing. It's not COVID because I'm negative. It's okay to everyone. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it, it wouldn't, but it wouldn't affect us either way. No, here. it's okay. I'll uh, breathe sure. over there. But as long as, as long as you're all right, uh, that's yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Um, did that all, yeah, did all that make sense? I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. worried that people on the, on the forums, are burning me in effigy. If I'm getting anything wrong, guys, tell me in about an hour, and I apologise. I have, to say, I have to say, I'm thinking well, on my feet at the moment. Simon, the you know we do that to people. Unfortunately, we we ask uh, Thank you. questions that people <laughs> aren't necessarily <laughs> expecting. But it, it makes well, I've never come, thought. Make, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd never thought of it. His songs, his playing style, is very melody focused. Of course, it is. Um, you know, he's told the story of coming up with his solo to be Rhapsody many times, and he wrote and he thought it out long before he even picked up a guitar. Mm -hmm. da -da 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 -da. That's how he wanted it to go, and that's how he and he played it. He got a specific sound, which is a specific pickup setting on the guitar, which is very different from the rhythm sounds that he has. Um, and uh, you know, it's the rest is history. The most iconic guitar solo of them all, I would say. It's it's interesting. You use the word. Well, you know, you're kind of quoting Brian about saying, you know, he did something instinctively, as in the mm. the, pick up, the way he used the uh, the the sixpence piece. Yeah, yeah. Instincts must be, you know, instinct and taste sensibilities must have had a you know a huge amount to do with how those records sounded and how the guitar was used uh, and mm. so on through through these processes you know it's a very subjective thing isn't it and to do it so consistently yeah. uh, that it resonates with 
you know, audiences, and that it has resonated with audiences all around the world. Yeah. Not once, but not, you know, we're not talking about, you know, having one great album or two great albums or three or four. Mm. This is, you know, the consistency is really remarkable, you know, and there's, you know, elements within the formula and, you know, the, this, the guitar is, is one of them. It was, I was also thinking it was interesting, you, you know, you, that there might be another, another dimension, an alternative dimension out there where Brian May didn't build the guitar and mm. played other instruments and may have had a whole set of different um, and just done things differently. But that the idea that it would have most likely been, you know, similar, um, brilliant in its own way, maybe, you know. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think they would have attained the same level of success. I can't, I'm not sure the music would have sounded that similar. I think he knew what the, what the, what sounds the guitar could make. So when they're presenting songs to the band or Fred comes in with, I've got this song called Bohemian Rhapsody, what do you think? Not that he, not that he did that because he put it together from various different songs and put them all together. But, mm. uh, you know, say, say we are the champions. There's, you know, there's no guitar solo in that, really. There's a few bits at the, at the end. But it's down to, again, this is what Phil was saying earlier. He was more interested in the music rather than I must have a guitar solo. You know, there's, the, the, but, and again, we will rock you. There's one of the best guitar solos that he ever did. And that's based around a chord, see, a chord that he's used all the way, the A chord. And then the two fingers, I don't know what it is, sus4, I think. Mm-hmm. Again, D over A, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Kill me afterwards, guys. I, re- I do apologise for my lack of knowledge on musical technology. I have no idea at all. Technique, I have no idea at all. But he's would let the music do the talking. And I think if he was trying to find a certain sound without the Red Special, as I say, he would do what everybody else would do and get 10 or 20 Use different what guitars. Use what and, he ser- to do. and search for the sound. Rather than him knowing... Mm. That the the bridge pickup out of phase with the neck pickup sounds like this, and the bridge pickup in series with the neck pickup and the middle pickup sounds like that through his AC30. That's so one of the he, reasons why it's never changed because he knows the sounds that he gets. And he doesn't need anything else. Yeah, I was going to say his intimate understanding of that instrument, uh, yeah, and the connection. I mean, there's stuff going on there as well, isn't there, Simon? Really, you know, the the connection must be you know, uh, the sentiment and the emotion, the emotional connection with that instrument is something, you know, most notable as well. Yeah, I think, I think, it's, I think it's a connection to, to his dad through uh, the Red Special. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I, we lost my dad well, 15, 16 years ago now, and it wasn't the nicest time in the world, because it isn't when you lose a parent. But it's, it's one of, sadly, it's probably going to happen to all of us we'll lose both of our parents before we go it's quite a morbid thing Mm -hmm. but he does tend to get very emotionally attached to it going back to taking the guitar apart Mm. um that must be terrifying well he didn't want to be in the he didn't want to be in the room right obviously we had to we got specific permission from him of course we did and it was taken apart by andy guyton who builds the best copies replicas i should say of the red special and Nigel Knight, who is one of the guys who, um, an electronics genius who maintains Brian's gear along with a couple of other people. They're both so talented and so good. Had, um, had, it, ever come know, up, had it ever come apart before, Simon, before it, that? It had been, ref, it had been, it had been uh, refurbished in 1998 by Greg Fryer, mm-hmm. who's uh, also a, I haven't really spoken to him for the last 10 years or so, but we used to be in touch a lot. He's a good guy very very skilled luthier and brian still uses one of uh, one of the fryer guitars um on stage as a spare along with the guidance mm-hmm. but i think that was the first time it had been taken apart since 19 since it'd been put together in 64 when greg took it apart in 98 that was the first time i saw the guitar um it was just in bits on greg's workbench at uh, brian's country pile country seat as it were and then andy did it a few years ago which we've detailed in the second version of the book in various updates mm. um it had a new volume pot put in a super pot that had been designed by nigel um and the guitar you know it's it's, it's as it's as robust as it can be you know 
these things, it's very fragile. It doesn't, from what I remember, it doesn't weigh a huge amount. It's very neck heavy. Um, it's a very I've, thick, is it not a very thick neck? Uh, made it's, a, of, it's, a, it's, it's very thick neck, yes. And it's, yeah. it is out of a, a mahogany fireplace. Not the, the body isn't made out of a fireplace. Can, can I ask, do, you, it, do you think it might be, so what you're describing quite characteristics of the instrument that are, you know, unique. Yeah. Do you think it might, you know, the, if, you know, sw switching to other instruments for Brian, uh, I mean, of course, mm. we know he does it and, you know, incredibly well. Yeah. But, you know, having used to the feel of that instrument, the thicker neck and so on, might that have contributed to why he's so, so you know, he, he, you know, that particular instrument was one that has stayed with him. Well, I'm not sure. I can only speak for me now. As a, I've, I've played the guitar for 40 years, mm. not to quite the same level of success as Brian, obviously, because I, oh. I'm a part-time bus driver. Hooray. I think we're hitting, the point, we're hitting a point where no one uh, in no. the world <laughs> left, play, you know, no. plays it as successfully or has, you know, he's, he's being... Um, uh, you know, I, I believe very modest about it. Uh, winning polls as the greatest guitarist, you know, left, right, and centre. And well, uh, yeah, he won a recent poll in in Total Guitar. My mates at TG put him top of their poll and mm -hmm. got a got a great Chris, their editor, got a good interview. Got a great interview with him actually, and he was very. I only read it. I don't have any insight to how Brian felt about winning that, but you know, he did say he was very very honoured to win it. Mm. And that's just what he's like as what he's like as a guy. He doesn't see himself. He knows how successful he is, mm. you know. But what sort of rock star, you know, saves money, you know, saves saves badges? You know, he gets the Mickey taken out of him mercilessly for it, and it's it's totally unnecessary. You know, he puts his his time and his and his. Uh, I assume he puts his finances in. I'm sure he just doesn't give him a couple of hundred quid and away you go. But he, but the born free the born free organizations that he champions it's so admirable you know if i was a rock star like him i go i'd be in mystique with my discreetly pregnant brazilian girlfriend you know yeah <laughs> i mean um yeah. yeah it's there's such a picture Sorry, emerging Mom. really it's great you know uh to hear from people who've had that proximity i mean the book in itself was very successful, uh, wasn't it? Um, and actually, there is this thought that we're talking about an instrument that's got its own f fan club almost, hasn't it? The Red Special Appreciation Society. Um, well, yeah, there there are quite a few. There are quite a few of those. I mean, a lot of those guys there um, know far more about it than I do, and I sometimes feel quite a quite a fraud in being able to written the book but having said that you know i got myself into position and, and it was just a position of trust and what we did with the copy of the book was if he said it then it's true you know there are certain details that a couple of the guys on the forum don't believe i don't mean they're being disparate you know, disrespectful disparaging but you know there's a, there's a thing there's a certain uh furore about whether the middle pickup was reversed round and reversed and Brian doesn't remember that happening, so he didn't put it in the book. But one of the guys on the forum, Mark, who knows much more than I do, and I'm sure he's right, um, is adamant that, that it was reversed. But if Brian doesn't remember it, I can't put it in the book. And because I'm more than a ghostwriter, we did write it together. Mm. Although, you know, as I said, obviously he had, he had final say on every, every single thing. Well, I mean, your name's clearly on the cover. But well, I'm, I'm very, Brian, yeah, I'm Brian very, made the guitar, so you know, well, well, I'm very grateful for him. Yeah. I did say I, I would very much appreciate having my name on the cover. He said, Of course, yeah. but it's not ghostwriting, yeah. you know. I didn't change any of the any of the words that he said, I just transcribed it, yeah, and uh, sort of knocked it and you know, edited it, got rid of the ums and the ahs, and you know, grammatical faux pas and what have you. But, you know, I wrote all the captions and helped pick the photos with Richard Gray and uh greg brooks from queen's archive department mm. so i've had more of a hand in it than just just in inverted commas a ghostwriter yeah. but like we were saying at the beginning you put yourself in those positions and uh you know pete's one of my best mates it's one of, it's the best thing that's come out of this my whole association with brian is my friendship with him because he's one of my best mates now 
And he certainly wouldn't have risked his reputation with Brian if he didn't think that I could have done a good job. Yeah. Because that's the, the way that you get in with, with people like Brian is to, like Phil was saying, don't be sycophantic, mm-hmm. but do a good job and be totally trustworthy. You know, if, if I'm invited to his house, you know, when you're interviewing these people, it's over the phone or in a record company office or something. But if you're going to his house and you're just a journo, just a bloke, and it's you and it's me, Brian and Pete Manandra and sat around the house. I'm sorry, sat around the table with the guitar in front of us with tea and coffee and, bli- and biscuits. Everywhere. That's a pretty lauded position for somebody to be somebody to be in. Mm. Somebody like me to be in. And you need to be a fan to care about the facts of the guitar before you even start and if you're a good writer which i am and you've got a lot of experience and you prove that you can be trustworthy over the years that's that's the bare minimum that's when you pitch the story that's when you pitch the idea you know you could he wouldn't allow anybody any pete wouldn't allow anybody anywhere near brian unless that person mm. could be trusted to do a good job I mean, I have a sense, you know, as we've researched, we've continued to sort of research for this conference. Yeah. There's this idea of, you know, you know, very much working, you know, the, the team is, uh, you know, the people involved are remarkable, are the best of the best. Yeah. And I would say uh, so. the output, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a factor in the outputs being um profoundly good um mm, absolutely you know part of the formula perhaps but i mean we've talked a lot about brian uh you know i think naturally because uh you know two of our guests today um yourself and phil mm. uh you know have sort of uh, you know um uh, you know been part of various teams um, so it's kind of been a very natural thing to do. Um, but again, there's this idea that, you know, the intricacies of each of the components of Queen, mm. uh, you know, having, a, you know, a, a similar or comparable level of remarkability to them, you know, Roger yeah. from the drumming side of things. So, the, you know, I mean, I'm thinking we, we're kind of run out of time again now. So I'm sort okay. of thinking of, uh, you know, uh, bringing this, you know this interview to uh, to a con- uh, conclusion. Sure. You know, but again, you know, right at the start of this uh, um, conference, somebody said, um, you know, I wonder if they'll say how remarkable Freddie Mercury was. And there's no doubt. I mean, one of the things that I was doing when we were researching, I had the pleasure of speaking to a guy called Mike Moran. And oh Mark yeah. Worked on uh, the Barcelona stuff uh yeah you know, well he did a number of things the great pretender and so on and in his own right you know he's uh, you know a, a genius you know um uh, a really clever guy um mm. but it was certain you know speaking to him about that part of queen uh, albeit solo you know the 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 optic on freddie mercury's genius mm. uh you know I can't help but feel we need to do another conference or, you know, maybe another thousand conferences and we might sort of get some sort of depth towards understanding how this remarkable success was created. But, you know, you know, also yeah. um, I, I had the pleasure... We didn't of... get depth, but we got a, a lot of perspectives, I believe. We have. Yeah, yeah so I think this is maybe more important. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, there's been some great, output you know some great uh perspectives um but i just like you know we we had you know i had the pleasure of speaking uh, evan and i spoke to a gentleman called peter hints and uh, you know he looked after uh john deacon and, and freddie mercury yeah a lot of the live stuff and mm-hmm. you know so we were getting you know things about how brilliant john was as well you know and um and actually on our last panel we've got uh, we've got a, a group of collectors who are going to help us understand you know i, I mean I, I think everyone's story has been fascinating uh you know and they've kind of come into um proximity to queen and you know yeah. uh, been part you know had moments where they're part of the story you know such as your yourself mm. um but we've actually got, uh, you know, the thought is it would have been lovely to also spend more time on Roger Taylor, uh, you know, 
uh, but we've actually got one of the collectors just uh, you know really focuses on collecting Roger Taylor, uh, who's become right. a you know a good friend, uh, John Daly, who you know we'll we'll, we'll bring in very shortly. Okay. Um, you know, so you know, and again, talking to people, you know, someone like John mm. really emphasizes, uh, you know, and I really don't want to be sycophantic, you know, but you, you can't help, you know, I work in and around the music business and I've done quite a lot of things myself. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've got a, a you know, deep academic interest in trying to sort of help people be successful in that area. And to actually have had the opportunity to sort of spend a day looking at Queen, uh, you know, and all of the research that we've been doing beforehand mm. has been really illuminating. And, that you know, points come out that will now be part of, you know, my repertoire, talking to future music people, you know, that I, I know will help them, you know, to be successful. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there's a great deal to learn from Queen and looking at all of these things I you know and so I'm sp I'm speaking myself and I suppose you know uh you know about today um you know I think it's been great but we're, we're going to move now on to the uh the final part of the day and we're going to spend cool. um, so we're running a little bit late but Simon thank you so much for your contribution no problem uh, it's been really illuminating and uh, you know I've got a great deal from it and I know from the comments of the people watching, uh, you know, they've all been saying very nice things. Um, oh, I'm glad. Well, everybody, if I've got anything wrong, I do apologise. I'm just sort of, whenever I, my mouth sort of runs away with me, as people who know me well know. So I apologise if I've got anything wrong. And uh, it's, been, it's been a wonderful, you know, the conversation, <laughs> Simon. Is, all good, yeah. You know, it gets, it gets everyone talking. You know, it's a great thing yeah. to do. So thank you so much. No problem, mate. I'll speak to you soon. Thanks so much. Have fun, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. So Bye. Much. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Okay. So um, now we will get. Ah, so we've got Ferdy. Hello, Ferdy. Can you hear me? Oh. Okay. Uh, we'll get everyone yes. else's cameras turned on as well. Um, we have another. We have John. Hello, John. You come live. Hi, Tony. Okay. That that T-shirt looks like one I've, on the. Thank God it's Christmas single cover behind you is it possibly or something i don't know in the yeah yeah choose life that's one of rogers and the yeah. nuclear van yeah yeah both both rogers one was um amateur fall video are you going to put them on for us no that, don't worry. <laughs> so so um also we've got uh, paul and we've got joe uh, and we've got uh jerome uh, though your, Jerome's cameras, I think, is off at the moment. Uh, Martin, our technician, oh, brilliant, excellent. Oh, wow. So, I, I mean, the first thing to is to look at, you know, to our the people who are watching, look at these artefacts in the background uh, that these very kind uh, gentlemen have brought today. Um, we, we're very fortunate to be joined by uh, some of, you know, um, you know, true collectors. Um, of Queen and other things in, in certain cases. Uh, you know, Paul was informing us, um, not exclusively Queen. Um, but um, one of the things that we'd, we'd ask them to do uh, is pick an item from their collection. So we're kind of, we're, we're really interested in um, the relationships that, you know, that the, the, the people have with Queen. Because, uh, you know, let's not, forget the audience uh, in in this um so we we invited some uh, you know of the sort of uh, biggest collectors that we could find uh, to come and share their perspectives uh, and we asked them all to pick uh, one thing in particular which i think they hated us for actually uh, putting them through this painful process because you know when we started this conversation it was like well there's this and there's this and there's this and this that you know uh, so hard to choose so apologies to everyone for that um, but you know who would like to go first who would like to talk us through their artifacts so that, that and, and what it means to you you know why it's so important can you hear me I can Joe yes so Joe's Joe's over in New York at the moment we've uh, you know, our friends here are from uh, different places all over the world, as we know, Queen uh, are very much international. Joe, yeah, please share with us. Um... 
Yeah, no problem. Um, one of the artifacts that I had picked was the uh, Blue Bohemian Rhapsody that was given out to um, partygoers in 1978. Uh, Queen had won an award for, I believe it was the best single. And what they did was they actually sent out invites to everybody. I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is the actual invite. And it shows the dates, the dinners, and the drinks. You got the invite in the mail or hand it to you. And when you were at the table, you got a blue Bohemian Rhapsody in a special 45 cover. And they were numbered. My number is 78. I believe there was 200 made that were numbered for the party. So, so, that, Joe, sorry, Joe, you've got number 78. And yes. was it 1978? Yeah. yeah so that, kind of, does that make it more valuable than 77? When I sell it. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it doesn't. But it's, it was actually kind of cool. That was 78 for the year. Um, well, I, I think we should say it's more valuable than 77. Sorry to whoever has 77. It's probably <laughs> one of the group here, isn't it? <laughs> or, or 79. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, yeah. And then what they did was they actually put it in a um, an oversized cardboard holder. So the single would actually slide into the cardboard holder. I'm sorry if you, can, you can't see it. Um, we and can see it. On the table, what they had was other, other artifacts were... Um, they had a blue scarf. Um, this is actually originally folded in the original plastic that it came in. And they also had um, uh, glasses with the, um, I don't know if you can see that or not, but it had the uh, insignia of, of the queen, 1978, and then EMI records on the other side. And there were two of them. This was kind of the set that everybody kind of put together um, uh, for the stuff that was on the table and that was given out at, the, at that, that uh, function. Um, but uh, it's probably one of the, one of the top collectibles for Queen, only because it's 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 the uh, the staple song of Bohemian Rhapsody, and uh, it's colored vinyl and it's forty five with a with a special sleeve, which kind of makes it unique. And the, and there was two hundred of them made, right? Two hundred. There are other other copies out there that were not numbered that they had pressed that eventually got out into the public and collectors. But the, um, the properly, there's only two hundred that were numbered. And and who would have been invited to that uh, party would you El were, we're talking Elton John and the likes or you know uh, it was more it was more EMI executives I believe the person that I got this from um I got it from the granddaughter of somebody that was invited uh he was a uh, I believe he worked for EMI so it was a lot of EMI brass uh people that worked for the company and probably friends of the band or uh, you know co-workers with the band but that would be uh, who would probably go to those parties it's fascinating, and of course, the fact that you're in America, and this would have taken. Where did this party take place in London? Presumably, yeah, in the UK. I'm not 100 percent sure where in the UK, but yeah, it was in the UK. So, I mean, it's quite a thing that you've managed to get it in that con remarkable condition. You, know, you can see, yeah, in, I was all lucky. together. Yeah, I was lucky. The woman uh, when I when I purchased the 45 from her, I just happened to ask her, "You don't happen to have the other stuff that was on the table?" And she goes, "You know, I think my grandfather does." And she went and. The glasses, the scarf, and the uh, invite were tucked away in a sock drawer. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, so I, I was fortunate. It's 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 tough to get it, all the pieces together. I got it all from one person, which was kind of cool. And uh, having the invite with that person's name on it is also kind of cool. Was it was the you know I've heard of some the royal purple vinyl of, of Bohemian Rhapsody. Is, is that a different thing? Yes, uh, oh. the purple vinyl was a uh, an anniversary. Um, I believe it was the 25th anniversary or okay. 20th anniversary of the of the song. And that was given out. Uh, it was pressed from EMI and given out at the fan club convention. And they were numbered also. So very cool, but not as cool. No, no, not not, not anywhere near as uh, as valuable as the blue. And I wonder, I wonder how much, you know, if Qu Queen must have been aware of this. Um, I believe the band got the first four numbers. Right. OK. Um, it, unless it's the other guys, over, other collectors might tell me I'm wrong, but I thought that they had gotten one, two, three, and four. But it sounds quite, you know, Queen had a reputation for, you know, being extravagant and, and grandiose. There is quite a sort of, uh, you know, specialness about, you know, the detail again that we're seeing. You know, it's. I'm, I'm curious. I, I don't think we'll know. We'll find out. But uh, you know, you wonder. You know, Queen wanted things doing properly, didn't they? There was certainly no doubt about that. Yeah, they, were, they, were, they, were, they wanted everything. They, everything they did was 100%. Um, yeah. You know, you know, recording their shows, recording their music, and um, making sure that it was uh, promoted properly. EMI and Electra, I, I deal a lot with Electra from the USA. Um, they, they pushed a lot of stuff when the band started to grow. They really pushed a lot of stuff to promote it.
hence all the collectibles we have now. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if it's worth moving at that point to uh, <clears throat> Jerome. And the reason I say that, because, uh, I, well, I don't know, was, was, there's the robot behind you, Jerome. So was that an Electra thing or was it an Electra EMI thing? Which, which country did that come into existence? Well, as uh, far as I'm aware, it was uh, for uh, record shops in, in Europe um, and not overseas, but um, there's a lot of mystery around it. Um, uh, there were also different versions. Um, so it's it's kind of hard to determine where they all went to and who got them and if record shops had to buy them or if they would get them for free. Um, there's a lot of mixed information, uh, really. All, the, all we know for sure is that they were made in France by a company made, uh, named La Hotte. Um, and yeah. And what was its, what was its purpose? What, how did they, how were they used? Well, in the record shops, um, they would be displayed and the vinyl could be put in the rack uh, to, uh, yeah, to display the new record. That's remarkable. I, I was sorry. I was just having looking at, at some of the comments. So, but it was the it was the robot from um, the News of the World uh, cover. Um, Correct. Yeah. Uh, there was quite. A, I mean, but there's again this sense of actually, you know, I don't ever remember going in a record shop and seeing anything quite as distinctive as that as a promotional tool. Uh, I don't know about any of you. It would t you'd, it would turn your you you would catch your eye, wouldn't it? Sorry, Joe. Yeah, I'm just going to say News of the World in America, too, was uh, was huge for um, promotion. And there was a lot of promotional items um, I, across the world for that album. It was such a it was such a big album for them as far as being promoted. I saw an astonishing billboard uh, sign that was sort of 3D. And, uh, you know, I think that was in in uh, maybe in Hollywood or something like that. But, um, you know, I'm sure you're probably aware of it. Uh, yeah. Jerome, you you actually uh, collect specific certain things, don't you? you you've a particular interest in. Um... Yeah, that's uh, that's correct. Um, just going further into the um, news of the world um, promotional stuff, uh, there's some some other things like the the other version I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I'll I'll try to bring it up. Oh wow! Uh, this was uh, a little display I had in uh, in my old house. Um, so there's two boards on the right. We know those are from the US, made by Electra, um, and the two different versions of robots. Now, the one I have behind me is on on the left, um, which has red eyes and a red rack, and just Queen on the on the on the chest. And the other one has uh, gray eyes, no detail, and Queen News of the World on the chest, and a different gray colored rack. Um, and uh, at the top, you can see various mirrors and clocks. Um, some were given away in competitions or uh, to EMI uh, representatives uh, and stuff like that. So there's some quite remarkable, you know, I don't, uh, you know, you know, it's hard to think of any other. I mean, I mean definitely of the era, there were bands who were doing quite remarkable, you know, uh, interesting things like this, but. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't happen that much now, does it? Certainly. Um, fascinating. Um, Thanks. <clears throat> yeah. Um, who, who should we move on to now? Um, Paul, uh, should we move on to you in the UK? Yeah, sure. Um, well, basically the French awards for innuendo, um, which is here, hanging up precariously. Um, what was it an award for, um, Paul? Record sales, record right. sales in record sales in France. Um, I do believe Brian's Brian's got one, so um, the rest of the band might have them, but they've got to be um, very limited. They're mm. very, they're very unique and probably cost quite a bit of money to produce each item um, with the the plastic dome and um, the polystyrene. Um, mount at the back with the album cover in a 3D relief. So it's it, it's interesting. It's the first one I've seen. 
Um, well, I've been collecting Queen since I was at school. It's the end of 1978. So, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I kind of want to, and then I don't want to, you know, be invasive, but how do you get hold of something like that? What what are the sort of well, techniques of collecting? Sorry. Most of the time, it's pure luck because everyone, everyone um, talking here is obviously mainly looking for the same items. And um, if something comes up, um, I get offered it, and and then I then I buy it. Um, I think Ferdy looks at records and unreleased outtakes and maybe personal items, which um, I don't particularly go for. Um, I'm, I, I am I am selective because, um, like many of the other big bands, Stones and the Beatles, um, Queen were, were released in so many countries, mm-hmm. and I come I just my own personal my own personal thing is that I I don't need forty copies of Night at the Opera because they're you know one from France, Germany, you know all the other unless they've got a different picture on the front. Um, I haven't got the room for them, and uh, I can't mm. see the point. But some people—that's what some people like. Some people will, spe- you know, be specific to <clears throat> one album, um, like News of the World, because it was a big album. But everyone, lots of people, just collect everything. Mm. So, well, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to see something really so scarce. Um, but I mean, again, there is the sense all of you have some incredibly, you know, rare uh, to unique um, items in your in your collections. And if I can chip in, I think that um, uh, probably by collecting these specific items, you got some sense of the of the band. Yes, you got a certain perspective yeah. of the yes. band. So actually, what I would like to ask you, you know, starting with those who didn't have a chance, what this uh, collection really tells you about about Queen, which people like us, or even people who wrote books about them, or even members of of the band themselves might not know about them. Yes, it's uh, exactly as you say because. Uh, when you start collecting and uh, you don't uh, uh, stop your collection only in uh, records or, or CD or anything else, you try to um, uh, trace the band story with, uh, with these artifacts. And uh, sometimes you discover some news that uh, there, there are not written anywhere. And even the band itself, probably, especially in the early days, have forgotten or probably didn't care uh, at the time to save those uh, uh, those uh, those special pieces. Uh, for example, all the first Queen period uh, about the the Trident era, when Queen were looking for a uh, for a contract, uh, there are a lot of rare pieces that can uh, put. When you put them together, you can uh, you can have a, a different view. On, on how Queen started their career. For example, uh, um, probably not everybody knows what an acetate is, but is a, is a sort of, of preliminary record, which is not made by vinyl, uh, where band um, transfer is uh, music, especially rehearsal. So for example, you can find some uh, seven inches or 12 inch acetate, which includes uh, a different version of the music, and uh, so, uh, as well as uh, from promotional stuff uh, like, like uh, press kit, press sheet from the early years, where you can find a lot of information. For example, uh, 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 Paul knows uh, the, the the famous Queen Pop Conference Group LP. What it is? Is the first Queen album, which came with a completely different cover with uh, all the Emmy executives printed on the back with a press kit on it. In the press kit, you read that uh, Queen are going to release this n- new album, which is uh, uh, probably uh, a small promotion that EMI did in 73. But you have information about Keep Yourself Alive single, which was the Queen first single that was going to be released on June 15, for example. 
that is written in that in, in that paper. While everybody knows, all the discographies knows that the single was out July the 6th. So there is an error probably, or they just have um, postponed the release of the single. But some years ago, we found a copy of a demo of Keep Yourself Alive with that date printed on it, stamped on it. And uh, then we knew that Brian didn't like the remix. So all the <coughs> process which is behind the making of the record, the release record, made again. And this is why that information was right. This is what collectors do, that, <laughs> do in, uh, in, in, in the work. They uh, collect a lot of information. And when you put them together and uh, above all, you share this information with other friends, with other collector, you can create an alternative, more deep uh, history of the band, which probably isn't so uh, interesting for everybody, you know, for the, for the, for the big masses. But we collector uh, uh, love this kind of things. We, we are sort of uh, the caretaker of, of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of these pieces. Yeah, I think this is sort of like, you know, you are historians and, you know, you have the archive. So, uh, you know, maybe one in interesting question, maybe at the end of that is, you know, what can be done with the archive for future historians? But we still have, uh, I think, uh, John, yes, to talk about his um, favorite item. I think you, you felt you didn't show it yet. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> I spoke of everything. This is my favorite uh, uh, item. What it is, is um, the personal Freddie Mercury test pressing for Bohemian Rhapsody, okay. which, which came with uh, his writing on the label. And uh, uh, it's a single-sided uh, seven inch because the, the very first pressing of the album, of the, of the single were made uh, each track on each uh, piece of vinyl. And, uh, why I love this, because uh, I, I imagine Freddie, uh, when he received his, uh, this single, because the band had to test the quality um, of the record before they, <clears throat> uh, they can give the okay to go on with the press. Uh, this is why there are two different singles, because you, you can choose to um, uh, repress only one track, for example. Um, and the idea that this is, was the Freddy's copy, it's, it's, um, let me think that he was very, very, um, uh, uh, how can I say? Um, it's like he was waiting for something to happen, no? As we also read in the, in the book. Also because you know that EMI didn't want a, a so long track to be released, you know? Uh, uh, more than five minutes uh, on a single in, in, in 75 was a, a big risk. Uh, so it's the start of something, in my opinion. This is why it's so special uh, with me. It came from Jim Hutton, so um, I, I know it's, uh, it, it's a special item. Thank you. And John, can you tell us your story, how your item, but also your sort of take on, on Queen? Sure, yeah. How, how am I supposed to follow that one? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, a, f uh, a few years ago, I was um, I had the opportunity to buy this. It was the snare drum, well, the snare skin, I should say, uh, used in the We Were Rocky video, Spread Your Wings, in Roger's back garden. Um, and it came with a story from... Uh, it had gone through uh, the Rory Gallagher's camp for some reason I don't know I didn't get to the bottom of it but I caught up with uh, Roger before a show a few years ago and asked him about it and he confirmed it but I still didn't find out I it didn't get much time uh, before the show but he did uh, sign it albeit if he, he didn't put the tail a bit on and wrote stomp stomp clap on it but uh, it's a nice piece of history I don't know if you can yeah, yeah, it's it's it is quite. I mean, all of these items are you know really remarkable, um, and 
you know, I, I, I mean, you, you, the scope and the amount of, you know, really uh, rare things, uh, you know, is also enormous, isn't it? Really, you, know, you could, you know, you could never stop. So, I, I mean, I guess part of it is about decide. Is it deciding about what you can collect? Realistically, you know, is that maybe why Jerome uh, particularly goes for you know a certain thing? Um, John goes for you know collects for Roger Tate a lot of, for Roger. Um, you know why you have your own things because it would be impossible to get everything, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah. So yeah. this is this is what I find interesting, and if you can talk for a couple of minutes, you know why you chose this specific you know path rather think, um, this I'm, type of. In, initially, I would think initially, um, especially if you were buying records when you were still at school, you would only buy a seven-inch single because maybe that's the only thing you could actually afford. So I started buying singles around about 19, 1973. Um, it wasn't until <coughs> 75, 76 that I will start to buy vinyl um, albums because obviously there were more more expensive so a lot of it's down to what what you can afford at the time i've sold items in the past um only to buy them again two or three years later and um, i sold 30 of the uh, queen one conference album um, and that was from my own collection but um i've had more since so that, that that's fine but i do more or less collect anything anything i like i don't particularly like modern items or fan made items um but it, i'm just waiting for a delivery of a, a queen fruit machine so it's interesting it's different um no idea where i'm going to put it probably in the garage but it, it's different you know just something that took, took my eye and i thought yeah oh, yeah i left that it's, it's fine what about you, John? Sorry? What about you, John? What history of Queen you create by your collection? Yeah, well, I just like the sound of, the, of Roger, to be fair. Um, and I have about, I think it's about 30 of, of his drum skins that he's used over the years. And probably about the same pairs of drumsticks as well that he's used over the years. It goes beyond um, Queen as well, doesn't it? For for you, John, uh, Roger has um, you know quite a significant solo. In fact, kind of they all you know did solo stuff, didn't they? Um, uh, you know, Brian, F Freddie, Roger, and and John did some things, didn't he? But um, you collect the you collect Roger Taylor's solo stuff as well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, all sorts, everything. Um, pr pretty much all the different albums from around the world, posters, well, you know yourself, the different posters that are from all around the world, different concerts that he did. What about you, Jerome? Because you have a very, you said that you are interested in these passes, yes? So you can say you, in your case, it's maybe like an almost geographical approach, yes? to Queen's history, how it happened this way or what you want to achieve by your collection? Well, um, I, I started collecting uh, live bootlegs um, many years ago. And basically from that, I went on a kind of a search uh, to find out which items I liked the best. Um, so I've had box sets, concert programs, um, posters and just a, a, a mix of all kinds of things um, and at some point I had the opportunity to buy um, a couple of backstage passes just a, a collection from a, a relatively uh, sizable collection of from a roadie um, and from there it just basically just just sparked off. I moved most of the, the other items I had collected over the years um, just to find and obtain more passes. Um, 
I like them because they are, you know, they're quite small in size. Um, they're easy to store. Um, and there's a lot of different designs, um, especially in uh, America. Um, most of the promoters have their own logo, their own design, and they put that on, on their passes. So, for example, there is this uh, set of three uh, shows in 1976 in Philadelphia. As you can see, the, the, the design is just from the concert promoter, Electric Factory Concerts. And they would just stamp um, the date and the band on it. Um, the fact that they are so different and that there are so many designs uh, just, just speaks to me. Um, and then you have uh, Queen's own uh, touring images, uh, touring passes with uh, their own design. Like, for example, from the News of the World Tour. Um, it's something more or less what a, what, a, what a crew member would get along with his itinerary and his jacket. So at the top, you have the, uh, the luggage tag, um, then uh, the you know, staff pass and the gas pass. And there's a lot of that for, for, for every tour. Almost every tour has like a set of this and um, yeah, local stuff uh, added to it wherever a, a promoter would want to. So there's, there's literally hundreds of different ones. Um, yeah, which, which makes it, it just a, a really interesting subject. But the, uh, you know, imagining all of the shows that Queen did, of which there were you know, an, an enormous number over the years. It's going to be impossible to get them all, isn't it? You know, the, there's going to be many shows where they're just, you know, a lot. Yeah. Mm. yeah, 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 definitely. And um, there, there, there wouldn't be one specific for every show, especially not by uh, by Queen themselves. Uh, it was that would be down to the promoter. You know, if they have their own uh, pass as well for maybe local staff or uh, whatever. So yeah, there it there are a lot. I I know of over four hundred different ones, um, and it's probably impossible to get uh, to get them all. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask you about the community? Because there's a sen really strong sense that you all know each other uh, very well, and. Uh, I mean, I think Queen have sort of, you know, there's a sort of long-standing history. One of the things I, I think probably, uh, you know, the, the Queen fan club was uh, sort of instrumental in um, keeping the band in contact with uh, their audience um, effectively in the days before it was really possible to, uh, you know, get, you know, have you know, to get information, really. You know, I think probably everyone here was collecting at a point in time or interested in the band at a point in time where, um, you know, there was just, there was greater demand than there was supply of information. Um, what what about the sense of community? You know, the, the you know, Queen fans uniting, there's, uh, you know, events happen, um, John and I, I think, were sort of uh, talking about a, a um, you know, where Queen fans come together once a year. Convention. Uh, yeah, the convention, yeah, sure, yeah. Well, the convention, I mean, this is, I found this, um, that there, let's have a look. That obviously gives away, that obviously gives away my age. That wow, was, okay. That was a, that was the first, that won, was the first, uh, first Queen uh, convention, which was in central London in 1978, a small affair, and they they didn't um, start doing them on a larger scale, usually at the the holiday camps, um, to '86. So I missed a few in the '80s, but I've been to at least 30, 34 maybe, um, once 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 a year. This is a thing. I mean, everyone everyone talking here I, I met at the convention um, that's where we met yeah yeah we all we all met at the, con at the convention 
Um, so, what if, this, if, what if this, con this sorry. sorry, what this convention say... gave you, uh, uh, apart from these sort of items, did you find out that you have something in common apart from the sense of, um, you know, collecting like similar tastes, not only for Queen but for something else? Ferdi, uh, maybe you. I remember uh, I I live in Italy, so it mm -hmm. was difficult for me uh, following the Queen Fan Club uh, uh, in the 80s. Uh, especially in the 80s, Queen were not so popular here in Italy. So I was a sort of uh, black sheep uh, with my mm -hmm. schoolmates. Um, I, I went at my first conversion when I'm, when I, where I met uh, Paul and, uh, and Joe in 1970. Um, 1997, uh, 97, okay, 97, um, and uh, it was uh, still a pre a pre uh, uh, internet era. Even if uh, uh, there was still some movement in, in internet about also Queen and the Funk Lab uh, uh, and so on. And I remember uh, after I I did my check in and um, uh, left my uh, baggage in the uh, in the room, passing in a window. I heard some voices and they were speaking about records. They were speaking about Queen memorabilia. So this is, in this room, there are collectors. And I remember I knocked and there was Joe, Paul, another famous collector. So <laughs> it's, it's just it, it just like uh, when you speak the same language. Of course, the basis is that you are a Queen fan, but we, 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 we find in, in few minutes and we never met before, we just, uh, pro of course, as collector in the in the early years, so your collector, you try to uh, communicate and, and write letters and then emails to all the collectors you 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 heard about in the world, and this is why you make you you you, you make community. And then the rest, the, the last twenty years, uh, of course, with the internet, with the with all the forum, uh, I, I knew. A, 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 a lot of other people, Jerome, John, and, and when you see that you speak the same language, of course, uh, a, a link is created. Can I, can I ask, is there um, I, I don't want to sort of uh, uh, be the, re the cause for lots of great friendships breaking up here. Uh, so I'm not going to ask who's got the best collection, but um, is there a competitive, you know, is, is it, a, you know, is there Sometimes a... it can happen, but um, when you when you when you find uh, people that thinks about uh, uh, thinks about collecting the same way you you are, is there is a sort of congratulation when you you find a, a, mm. a great item and, and a little envy? Yes, there is. But we we are happy each other. Uh, probably, I think that uh, other guy thinks the same when uh, because because we know. That uh, if a special item is found by Jerome, Joe, Paul, or John, we know that it will be carried mm. as a collector can, as a collector has to do. That's a really, that's really profound, actually. You know, but there's also, and I, I, I really, I, I think it's a great thing that you would, you know, you looking, you know, what each other's looking for in in one sense, don't you? So, you know, and if it's something that you've got, and you you know, you can use that intelligence collectively, that information. Yes, um, of course, it it happens. Of course, that probably uh, uh, it's happened in the past that we we talked with the same guy who had a special item. So, but we we didn't know before because when you start a connection, of course, is a, is something very private, no? But no problem. <laughs> so, how how big is the you know, I'm just sort of trying to get a sense of the scale of this activity, you know, and, and how, you know, do you have, uh, you know, obviously we set up a small um, group so we could talk here. You know, is there lots more of you who, uh, you know, you kind of, um, this family, this community that uh, you have these relationships with? Yeah. With social media. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say with social media, it, 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 to me, it, it ballooned. There's so many different people that are, you know, with, with social media, you find that are into the band and collect the band. So that, that helped a lot over the last 20 years too. I also, one of the things that as a collector, it, 
I actually like when guys find pieces that I don't have because I know now I know they're out there. Uh, there's there's certain things that to this day still show up in America I didn't even know existed. So once I get it, if I share that information with the other collectors, at least now people are looking for it and can find it. So it then feels- they didn't make just one. So that, that, that it, it's a it, we all help each other. There is competitiveness, but there's also we also help each other. There's a thrill of discovery. How often do you actually find something that none of you knew existed? Is it must be rare? Oh. It's, be, it's becoming uh, very difficult now. Mm. Yeah. Because <laughs> so that in you know how can we bring all this information together? I know um, Record Collector did a really great um, you know um, Paul. Uh, had a lot of his collection uh, photographed in it. And I'm not sure how that came about, but uh, there are, you know, is is there some sort of central place online where well, all there's this a book, information there's a book is coming together? Out. Pardon? There's a book coming out by Greg Brooks um, <laughs> called I Want It All that everybody here, I believe, was involved with helping uh, to get together. Uh, and it's going to be just about every piece of memorabilia that they can get their hands on and photograph and put into the book. Um, and it'll open up a wide range of people seeing the different stuff across the world. That, uh, has, has, that he, has, he, has he worked with Queen on that yes. project? Okay. Can I ask, are there any female collectors? Because somehow it happens that we have only men here, and uh, generally, you know, Tony chose rather male lineup, so to speak, which is not understandable because Queen is, uh, uh, you know, Band men, men, no, they're, they're, all, men. They're, they're all female collectors, um, but fewer, fewer probably. I go over to the convention every year and I set up a booth and I bring a lot of USA stuff that I buy, sell, and trade. There's a lot of girls that come to the booth that, um, that buy stuff, they're always buying stuff, and especially at the convention at the uh, at the marketplace, that, that, that's what they call it. Uh, there might be varying sizes of the of the of their collections, but there's a lot of women that buy Queen stuff. Okay, so we we have to track them down next yeah. time, Tony. Yeah, must do better. Uh, is is I think what I was telling me there. I've got one mm-hmm. last question actually because we we've kind of run out of time. Um, <clears throat> but and I know Paul collects uh, lots of other things as well. Um, but there is this sense, you know, we, through the conference, trying to sort of, you know find things that we can bring into focus of, you know, why Queen have been so successful uh, and so important uh, to to people's lives. And, you know, what was it for you that switched you on to, on to Queen? Should we, should we start with Joe and very quickly go, uh, go around the, the group if we can? Uh, how I started uh, as a, as a kid, I grew up, I, well, I actually, Beatles were my favorite band. Yeah. Um, when I was young. Um, and then I heard, I actually had my first song I ever heard was uh, Bright and Rock from Sheer Heart Attack album. My next door neighbor used to crank it out his windows. We used to play, you know, play in the street with uh, with other friends our age. Mm-hmm. And I actually knocked on his door and asked him, what is that? And he told me it was Queen. So that's how I, I started listening to them. And then I heard Night at the Opera and I never looked back. It so, just... so, so it's a connection with your youth. Does, that, does anyone else, is there anyone who doesn't like the Beatles? in this group out of curiosity i'm not a particular fan of the beatles um yeah i'm more like springsteen uh a a little bit heavier stuff i guess i just wondered if there was maybe certain things under you know so if queen's influences somehow translated within you know within the uh, sort of sensibilities of audience, you know, but um, perhaps that's, it's too big a question, isn't it, really, to ask? Um, I don't know. I think the, th- the thing is, once, I mean, I think audiences, um, the, obviously the Beatles stopped touring in in the 66, so um, you could only have to imagine what they might have done um, after, after that. But yeah. um, I don't really say, think you can say that you like Queen one thing because you like Queen. another. I can't say that Queen were any any way a replacement because for the Beatles because they said that of they sort of said that of Mark Boland. You know, he was because he had the the, the fandom. You know, he's idolised just like the Beatles were. So people used to say, "Oh, he took over from the Beatles," and obviously Ringo Starr done a lot of work with him and more or less sort of cemented that idea that 
he, he was in some ways a follow on but at the same time there were lots of the teeny bop bands who were really big in their own right and mm-hmm. then you had all the prop bands that were really big the genesis and people like that so he used to draw in a lot a lot of male audiences um but i think queen obviously struck it across the board and got a bigger audience and kept getting a bigger a bigger audience um as they developed as like bowie developed and sort of boland didn't so you know he was still stuck doing the glam stuff when when sort of bowie had moved on and queen had moved on and everyone had sort of moved on yeah. and a lot of them sort of survived the the punk era <laughs> and just kept on kept on going it just sort of become uh-huh. probably a phenomenon of you know if you look at it from that that way yeah i mean i wasn't i wasn't su- suggesting uh, or thinking of them as a replacement rather you know, only the... only in the sense that the um only in the sense that the Beatles could be heavy when they needed to, mm. but be have more gentle sides. And you can get all of that within one Queen album. You can get the, the heavier side and you can get the melodies. So, I mean, if you start thinking of bands who used to use harmonies, you're going to think of the Beatles, the Beach Boys, and you've got to, you've got to think of Queen as well. Of course. So, so they did, in a way... Um, everything yeah yeah I mean, it's that that idea you know we have algorithms now that kind of point us in the direction of certain things you know if you 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 might like that because you like that and i was just uh sort of thinking of it you know not making an observation but throwing out a you know i suppose um a thought for people to uh, consider, you know, uh, about that. But that's really insightful, Paul. Thank you very much for that. Um, so the question, which I've forgotten what it was, uh, why Queen? Ferdy, do, do you want to... I was I was uh, eight years old when my, when my elder brothers uh, brought me to see, to watch the Fletch Gordon movie at the cinema. I was very, a very young uh, kid. Um, when we... I was blown by the film mm. because uh, I, I, I didn't see... Uh, yet uh, Star Wars, so I think it was a great movie, and the music too. So when we went out, uh, instead of buying a snack, our mother gave us some money for buying buying some snack after the movie. We bought the LP, the album. That is my first meeting with Queen. Some months later, somebody recorded me a tape of Greatest Hits One, and then everything started. And the connection was made later in my life. Because when I read somewhere that Freddie was a great Jimi Hendrix fan, I, I went to listen to Jimi Hendrix. And so all the 60s, all the 60s were very important in my musical knowledge. The Who, um, uh, even mo- also, for example, I didn't, I didn't know Mod the Hoople. I, I didn't know what Mo- Mo- the hoople. When I heard the Queen toured with them, I started to listen. So this is why when you are a young boy, try to make your connection uh, before YouTube, before Spotify, <laughs> before the algorithms, as you say, you know, yes. uh, or, or, or some friend that say, listen to this, listen, uh, because there are influence in this music. So we, we grew up in that way in the 80s, I speaking of uh, for myself. Mm. Well, I, I can relate to all of those experiences. Uh, Me you know, too. Me too, very much so. And it, but it is quite different now, uh, you know, with everything at your fingertips, isn't it, really? And, um, you know, for, for new audiences. But, you know, clearly we see Queen continuing to uh, appeal, you know, their audiences expanding um, without limitation, so it seems. But thanks for that. So, um, Jerome, why, why Queen then to, to you? <laughs> Well, since uh, I didn't see them live um, and I wasn't born when they were last touring, um, that was kind of impossible for me. But um, I found uh, a cassette tape uh, in my grandmother's attic uh, when I was around 10, 11, maybe, uh, which belonged to my aunt. Um, I went to some 
uh, difficult times, family-wise, parents divorcing. And I don't know, it just appealed to me. Um, I think it's like in the in the second paper uh, from the from the first part of this interview. Uh, they, yeah, you can put your own emotion into it, uh, your own um, your your own situation uh, is reflected by the music. It's 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 general. Um, it, it doesn't really have to mean anything from Freddie himself. Like uh, was. Um, I'm not saying implied or whatever, but um, it's yeah. You you can apply it to your own situation, and it applied to me very well at the time, and it just took off. Yeah, um, I, I think you know again. You sort of mentioned when I was around ten. I think you know that was quite a sort of for a lot of people an age where people were fine. You know connecting with things uh you know and music very often uh, it's interesting to see how those relationships have developed into these incredible collections um and encyclopedic knowledge uh and uh, you know which is an, another very important part of it. it's a journey of discovery isn't it it's a a, a a completely different level of experience um you know that you you've all you're taking that you're that you're on this journey you know uh, john you know why why queen i think we're about to finish now paul you kind of did tell us um uh, you kind of did answer this question but we'll just come back to you in case there's anything you want to say after after john what why queen john yeah it was just the, the sound and the look um and then everything um the, the promotional stuff, the robots, and, you know, when you're a kid and you're seeing pictures of the robot and then you finally get to get one. I think uh, everybody's got one in the group. I think everybody's uh, managed to get one these days. So it was on, on today anyway. It's just the whole package, really, wasn't it? It was the, the whole visual thing as well as the the sound. You captured your imagination, uh, but the sort of course, you know, one of the things that's truly enduring about Queen is is their songs, isn't it? You know, the the songs that they wrote um, that connect so deeply to have fostered these these other deeper interests. I think um, would would I be right in in thinking that for for all of you? Yeah, so it's all about the music. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you listen to a Queen album, and I think Paul had mentioned this. That you go from you can go heavy, heavy is uh, very heavy, to very light, all in the same album. And I like that. I like the different peaks and valleys. I don't like being heavy across the board or light across the board. There's just so much different music and so many different styles within one album that just just catches my ear. Every song, look one net to the next, always caught my ear. I, I can relate to everything you've all said as well, you know, so it's um, it's great to hear that I'm not on my own <laughs> in, in this, but uh, yeah. Thank I, I, you. Paul, I'm sorry, right. after you ever. Yeah, yeah. You... No, I just I just wondered if we finished by the stage or Paul has something to add. It's only like, you know, people saying exactly when they heard um, Queen for the first time. Um, I did sort of touch on it on the, the, the small um, article I did with the record collector. Was, um, we used to have the, in England, we had the, the, um, the chart program, Top of the Pops, and this is the thing, all the producer, the, the laws, most of the bands, well, all the bands mimed. Um, and a lot of the bands didn't actually like to go on there. We heard things like they had, rubber symbols so you know they hit the symbol nothing happened because they were just miming so when it was christmas 75 although i'd already known about queen um the fact is that they didn't go on their mime they they produced a film for the bohemian rhapsody single um and then the, the, the film itself actually bought brought the queen 2 album sleeve alive as such, um, the whole thing was just like, well, what, what, what's going on here? Because it wasn't someone miming their song. 
Queen done very few performances on Top of the Pops. Um, most bands done all their performances on Top of the Pops or other um, shows, TV shows, um, through, through the years, Supersonic um, and other things like that. But I think that was it. Once they got the exposure that they needed in 75 with the live Hammersmith show, which they now call the legendary live Hammersmith show, because it was, you saw it live, you saw the band, who were obviously high in the charts, number one album, number one single. Uh, it, it's the only way they could go. They had to go up from that moment in time. So although I knew the band and listened to the band before, um, probably a lot of people like myself saw them for, I think it was nine weeks. I think it was at number one, by me and Rhapsody. So you saw a film of a band rather than someone miming. And I think that wasn't the, wasn't the first people to produce a film for a single. But it was a catalyst to, to their greater exposure, you, you're, you're saying? Yeah, because it's, it, was, it was more or less... Queen uh, were of the... MTV was made for Queen. Like all the other bands had to get on board. And I think Queen were already there producing um, films, videos as such for every single single. So um, they'd already had that back catalogue, hadn't they, as well? You know, so there was pipeline for MTV as well, which, uh, yeah. you know, and, and I suppose MTV coincided with their, in, you know, arguably peak popularity in America, uh, in North America in 1980, around the game time as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, Tony, it's quarter past five. I think uh, we, we have uh, getting told our off, time, please. and I will uh, probably patience also of our guests and uh, audience. So thank they you. They could so talk forever, you know, and our audience is still there. But Evie, you're absolutely right. Can I just finish by thanking yes everyone today? You know, it's been you know we really appreciate the time people have given us. We really appreciate the people who've been watching and the people who are going to watch. Uh, you know, and think about this legacy um but i you know again I, I feel i should thank jim beach um uh who encouraged us before covid when we were planning on doing this uh, uh wished us luck with it uh phil symes jackie from the fan club of course brian roger uh, and queen um uh you know freddie and john um and have i forgotten anyone ever I uh, think the university also the arts council our technician, Martin. Martin, thank you, Martin. We who couldn't have this made it possible, not for the first time, and uh, actually for maybe fifth time or so on by this point. So the fact that everything worked in the end is uh, thanks to Martin. Martin, thank you very much, if you are still here. Yes, he fixed our problem, our technical problem. Yes, thanks um, so much. And thank you for coming. I think this was extremely um, you know, informative. Um, and also, uh, I guess, help us to um, uh, solve other puzzles related to other musicians and to the world of popular music at large. So thanks so much. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you.